Welcome back everybody to the 2021 NCF Envirothon hosted by Nebraska. I'm Dean Edson. I'm the executive director for the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts. I'm here to welcome you back and make a few announcements. Um, I'm supposed to give you a little bit of background on myself, a little self-introduction. And so I'm going to start a little lightheartedly for you. Um, I used to farm in central Nebraska full time back in the 70s and 80s and the ag crisis hit us, uh, hit Nebraska pretty hard in the early 80s. And I lightheartedly tell you this, that uh, it was uh, a troubling time, but my banker and I had a good working relationship and I think that's important for you to know from the standpoint is you're going to have to work with people in every field of, of your work endeavors or whatever you do. But my banker and I came to the mutual conclusion that both of us would be better off if I was in a different line of work. Um, he'd make more money off of better loans. Uh, I'd probably make more money doing something else. Anyway, I, I went back to school, a non-traditional student, age of 28 got a degree, uh, started my career uh, working for Nebraska Farm Bureau as a director of state governmental relations. Did that for 11 years. And since 1997, I've been the executive director for the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts. Um, when I left the farm back in 84, I made it a goal that I wanted to own that farm someday. And so that was a goal and objective of mine. Um, and I'm here to tell you that that all worked out. And so all of you kids that are listening in here, all you students and you're the top students in each of your state, always remember, set goals and objectives. Uh, make them attainable. Once you attain those goals and objectives, cross them off, make some new ones. Um, your, it will, your life will be much, much better and you'll be a much, much happier person. Anyway, um, Again, I want to congratulate all the teams um, for competing and testing and the oral presentations. Everybody did a wonderful job. Um, you learned, you all learned how to work together as a team to come up with solutions to issues, uh, answers to questions. Uh, you're going to find that true all the way through your whole career. Is that whatever issue you're working on, there's going to be differences of opinions. I uh, encourage you to keep an open mind, listen to other people, listen to their concerns, um, try to evaluate, evaluate the situation, and try to create win-win situations and help resolve the issues. So whatever you do in your career, um, even if you go off and do something else and you're still interested in environmental issues or water issues, you can still be involved. Um, take a look at the opportunities that are in front of you Always, again, keep an open mind, keep learning. What we're gonna do this afternoon, um, I'm gonna outline just what, what we have for this afternoon's events. We'll be announcing the top three teams um, uh, that will be competing. We will be having a video on the Platte River Basin time lapse. This is a project that the NRDs were involved with uh, with a bunch of other partners here, our irrigation districts, our farm organizations, uh, environmental groups, to follow the Platte River all the way from its origins up in Colorado, follow the South Platte River down through Colorado back into Nebraska and the North Platte River, uh, leaving Colorado, going into Wyoming and then eventually back into Nebraska. And then where the two rivers join out at North Platte and following, following the Platte River then all the way to its confluence. Uh, so I hope, hopefully you'll enjoy that video here in a little bit. Uh, we will also be having the top three oral presentations this afternoon. Uh, that will be coming up later. Uh, we will also have closing ceremonies and announcements of award winners, station awards, and the top 10. Um, there will be 10 teams that will receive prizes. <clears throat> and, and immediately following this announcement, I'm going to announce the top three teams. Um, the top three will be sent an email with details how to access Zoom for their presentations. 
Now, I want your team captains to be watching for this, this email. Uh, we're not going to name the, the teams. We're going to go by numbers. So, and these are in no particular order. So the first one, team 2138. 2138. Congratulations and look for an email. The next one, team 2118. Congratulations and watch for your email. Again, 2118. And then finally, the third team, team 2141. 2141. Watch for an email and you'll get further instructions. Next up, I want to transition this over to Grant Reiner. Um, uh, he's the producer of the Platte Basin Time Lapse. He won't be live, but the magic of TV will roll this into a video. So on to the video we go. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Grant Reiner and I am a producer with Platte Basin Time Lapse. So in 2011, conservation photographer Mike Forsberg and filmmaker, filmmaker Mike Farrell started the Platte Basin Time Lapse Project to answer this question. Where does our water come from? And also to set a watershed in motion by leveraging the power of photography and storytelling. The Platte Basin drains 90,000 square miles in parts of three states, Wyoming, Colorado, and Nebraska. It is a semi-arid region in the heart of the North American continent. The Platte's legacy is that of a wild braided prairie river, but in the last century as America, America grew west, it has been mostly tamed and today waters one of the most important breadbaskets and agricultural powerhouses in the world. The Platte gets its water from three sources snowpack from the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and Wyoming, the Ogallala Aquifer, one of the largest groundwater reservoirs in the world, where almost half its total volume lies underneath the Nebraska Sandhills, and our region's weather, where average annual precipitation can range across the basin from 8 inches in the far west in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains to over 30 inches in the more humid east. When the project started in 2011, the bathtub was full. This was the Platte River at Rose Sanctuary in central Nebraska in midsummer. And then in 2012, someone turned the water off and the basin experienced historic drought conditions. But wouldn't it be cool if we could compress time and see all that change take place from wet to dry? Well, now we can. By compressing time with time-lapse photography, what would take years to watch in real time can be compressed into just minutes or seconds. The result is a new way of seeing process on the land. It brings that old, boring physical geography textbook to life, and it shows the land as a living, breathing organism. To date, we have installed more than 60 time-lapse cameras across the basin. Our highest camera in the watershed is at Lake Agnes at 11,000 feet. These are the headwaters of the North Platte River. Our lowest camera is located at the drain, 600 miles and 9,000 feet downstream, where the Platte River joins the, the Missouri River near Omaha, Nebraska. This camera was lost to the river during the historic 2019 flooding. This is what our time-lapse camera systems look like from the inside. They are Nikon DSLR cameras protected by a waterproof housing that are powered by solar and controlled by Raspberry Pis. They are completely custom built by our camera technician, Jeff Dale. Here is a time-lapse of a time-lapse camera being built and installed. This is all great, but why are we doing all of this? The Platte River Basin is one of the most appropriated river systems in the world. Every drop of water is spoken for and little is free. The basin supports an industrial agricultural powerhouse laid over one of the most endangered and altered grassland ecosystems on Earth. Beneath the ground, it harbors more than half of the mighty Ogallala Aquifer, 
fossil water whose quantity and quality are at stake. Today, this basin is being asked to be both food producer and energy pump in an age of climate change and economic uncertainty. So again, what do we hope to accomplish with this project? To answer the questions, where does our water come from? What is the journey water takes it to make to your faucet or center pivot? What role do humans play in this journey and what is at stake in our decisions? What could, what could we learn if we could see change on a landscape in a new way? Could we build a community around seeing a watershed in this new way? Could this project be a template for other watersheds around the world? This is what inspires us and this is our, this is our aim. All of those images you just saw were taken by some of our time-lapse cameras. So now we are going to take a look at one of our locations in a bit more depth. This is a camera we have at UNL's Gunmanson Research Station north of Whitman in the Nebraska Sandhills. Time-lapse is not limited to just videos, but with more than one million images recorded, our project has the ability to create many different styles of time-lapse presentations to better understand processes across the Platte River Basin. So we can tile images together to show a year of time. We can string them together to create a video. Or we can merge, slice, and tile together still frames in unique ways to show how a landscape changes over time. This image is from 2013, and each one of the 12 bars represents one month. The same thing goes for this image. We can also tile videos. So here are 16 of our cameras that take you on a journey from the top to the bottom of the watershed. We are also pairing time-lapse images with acoustics to not only learn how the landscape changes over time, but also to understand the species that are present. These are what some of our camera setups look like. On our website, you will find dozens of stories produced over the years. We are using these innovative technologies to set a watershed in motion and to tell stories about the Platte River Basin. We are photographers, videographers, writers, designers, developers, technicians, scientists, and researchers, education, ed educators, and students. We are all storytellers. So what do we do with all of this media? We use it to tell stories that go on our website. Here is a short video on our watershed.
PBT is not only time-lapse cameras. Our team is a diverse set of individuals, all with their own set of skills. However different we may be, we are all conservation storytellers. Well, this is me. Uh, my love for photography and videography started in college while I was getting a degree in fisheries and wildlife. But really, my love for nature started in high school. And I spent every moment I could outside. Um, and then after undergrad, I got a master's of applied science with an emphasis in science communication. And now I'm pursuing that. And uh, I'm going to talk about one of the projects that I, that I started during my undergrad. So I spent two years getting my master's degree and decided to conduct my project in the Wildcat Hills near Scotts Bluff in Gearing, Nebraska. Uh, the Wildcat Hills are considered a biologically unique landscape uh, consisting of short grass prairie, mixed grass prairie, ponderosa pine woodlands, mountain mahogany shrubland, freshwater seeps, and western sandstone cliffs to name a few of the terrestri terrestrial communities found in this geography. I decided I would create uh, short films for the Wildcat Hills Nature Center. This first short film is titled Low Intensity. We've learned in the past 10 years that fire is not always bad. We have understood that we can control fire with fire and it has a huge impact on the regrowth and the forest of our areas. I'm the fire chief for the Gearing Fire Department. We are in Cedar Canyon Wildlife Management Area, which is about seven miles southwest of Gearing, Nebraska. You know, the Wildcat Hills is a gorgeous area, unlike anywhere else in Nebraska. It's a span of hills and different bluffs and buttes that start somewhere in Wyoming, Nebraska border, and go closer to Bridgeport. But we've seen fire behavior that we haven't seen in the past. About two or three years ago, uh, we had the idea that maybe we can create a fire exercise and bring people in from around the area to help put some type of team and firefighters that are truly qualified to manage this fire. We're getting our firefighters out here to recognize the terrain. They're getting in the ability to see what they're up against in the event that we do have a large fire that comes through here. We have 27 engines from Pueblo, Colorado. Colorado Springs, Cheyenne and Laramie, Imperial, Madrid, Keystone, Lemoyne, Ogallala, Baird, and then we have Nebraska State overhead from Emergency Management, and Nebraska National Guard, State Fire Marshal's Office, and Nebraska Forest Service. We really found a need that we need to have some aerial resources in Nebraska. So can I pick him up direct, or do you want me to come to you? No, you can pick those up direct. Communication is always the biggest issue we run into. Statistically, you've seen a lot of fire fire fatalities and injuries result from communication issues. So we're trying to really beef up our understanding and our training and communication with aircraft. Reese Flowers. Hey, I just got to pull the ops. Um, they gave me permission to take this. 
this applicator and start pre-treating this candy bias. Uh, copy that. see growth and overgrowth of fuels and when we're talking fuels shrubs grasses trees the minute that they become more dense and drier seasons if there is a fire that's affected in the area let's say it's caused by lightning you're gonna have that fire move into those fuels at a much faster rate at a much hotter environment that it's gonna decimate the whole forest so when you're able to produce a low intensity fire, thin the forest out and put fire on the ground, ponderosas react in a way that it's gonna release its seeds. It's gonna drop on the ground and regenerate a lot healthier. The grasses are gonna come back greener for the elk, for the sheep, for the deer that are in this area. The shrubs are gonna be decreased so that way we don't have that really hot fire behavior move through the land. You know, the fire service is a family. Every single firefighter that's on the ground, 98% of them are volunteers in every community in Nebraska. You belong on a fire department, you're a firefighter. This is the final and uh, longest short film that I produced. It showcases some of the conservation efforts that are going on in this working landscape. The North Platte River in western Nebraska. Flowing from mountains to plains. Throughout its existence, this once wild braided river supported cultures throughout time. Indigenous peoples, settlers moving west along the Oregon Trail, and families making a life today in agriculture. Along the path of the river, a unique landscape stands out amongst the rest. It's home to species specially adapted to the harsh terrain, both prey and predator. Through millennia, this land was shaped by the flow of the river and the force of the weather. The wildcat hills, wild lands and the high plains. A 
a landscape long forgotten. Where hidden springs slowly meander. Taking centuries to carve deep canyons. And where rocky escarpments rise high above valley floors. Islands in a sea of grass. The Wildcat Hills thrive in an era of developed landscapes. The Wildcat Hills are a truly unique ecosystem. These are real rugged landscapes. There's lots of nooks and crannies in them, and there's a lot of wildlife. One of the hidden secrets has been that not too many people know what lives in the Wildcat Hills. They've become a great resource for this area. It was really surprising, all the canyons and the rolling hills and the buttes. It was just completely different than anywhere else in Nebraska, completely unique. It was love at first sight. I, I wanted to go back, and so I did. Located in the panhandle of Nebraska, the Wildcat Hills span across 55 miles east to west. Throw my shoulder out. <laughs> it all started with backpacking trip. Let's get it. All right, there we go. Spittlebug. <laughs> Spittlebug. I would not have known that it was Nebraska if somebody just dropped me off out there. I probably would have guessed Colorado or Wyoming because Nebraska is supposed to be flat. I was trying to figure out how I could communicate about the conservation going on in the Wildcat Hills. Mike Borsberg mentored me throughout this entire process. Somebody would blindfold you and drop you in the middle of the Wildcat Hills somewhere. I think you'd be amazed that you were in Nebraska. A lot of this land is protected in conservation. If somebody wants to come out to the Wildcat Hills and go walk into this landscape, as long as you're on Platte River Basin Environments lands or you're on one of the public lands, you can go till your heart's content. And there's not a lot of places like that in the plains right now. FreeB is an acronym for Platte River Basin Environments. Our focus is the North Platte River and the environments that flow into or created by the North Platte River system. Our view was that we should be prepared to do things that would enhance that whole drainage because we had a broad enough view of things that it's not one little piece at a time, it's watersheds <laughs> at a time. At stake is that we don't have enough open, contiguous space to support these large herds of bighorn sheep and elk and deer, and then they'll go away. I've ruffled a few feathers saying the most invasive species we have in the West are 40-acre ranchettes. If you end up with a house here, a house there, it just changes that whole landscape. Part of our vision was that we would have large tracts that would forever be unencumbered. You can get away in the Wildcat Hills. You can walk for 10 straight miles and still be on public land. I mean, if I can go there one time and fall in love with it, so can a lot of other people. But they need to know it's there first. I've managed Platte River Basin properties for over 20 years. I think in just recent years, we've had the opportunity that a lot of lands have been opened up for public use. It's important for us that people go out and can enjoy the wildlife on these lands. We knew we needed good science. It's important for us that our lands remain working landscapes. Our managers are really the cattle that our ranchers operate on our land. Pat Reese will tell you that it all starts with the grass.
Over this entire region, there is a phenomenal amount of topography. The diversity of plant and animal species is representative of a large ecotone. It is literally an area where both plant and animal species from the east and west meet. Well over 90% of all the land in the state of Nebraska is in private land ownership. Platte River Basin environments, their commitment to public access and proper management of lands is unbreakable. This is very quick access to wild lands. They are wild. With recent game cameras and with you, Grant, coming to our area, it's really opened up our eyes to the amount of wildlife that's up there. One way that I can get people to care about this landscape is by showing them things they normally wouldn't be able to see. I have chosen to use camera traps and trail cameras. They stay on the landscape, they're motion activated, so when something walks in front of them, it'll trigger that camera. They either take a photo or it'll take a video. One of the camera traps that I have is on top of a butte. It's designated for bighorn sheep. Bighorn sheep have kind of a white rump, you know, but otherwise are, are brown in color, and the rams in particular, which have the horns that grow into a curl. One of the reasons of population's decline was loss of habitat. It's critical now that what we still have can be conserved and protected. Preview's been a big part of that. Couldn't have done it without them, to be honest with you, to protect these last great places. It's, it's been a great success so far. You know, we got some challenges ahead of us, but we're hoping to keep it going. A lot of people don't realize that bighorn sheep were native to Nebraska. The bighorn sheep technician out in the Wildcat Hills, I've gone out with him a few times to kind of understand what his role is in the bighorn sheep reintroduction. So each caller sends out a different radio frequency. You just type in their frequency on this transmitter and my Omni antenna on the roof picks up the signal and it gets stronger as we get closer. There's around 155 individuals in the Hubbard's Gap herd and then there's about 50 in the Cedar Canyon herd. The amount of time I spend studying them, kind of just realize that they're kind of like humans. They each have their own like individual personalities. And so as often as I see them, you kind of get to learn them as individuals instead of, you know, just bighorn sheep. That's one of our collared ewes right there at Red 18 with her collared lamb, White 126. So that's, that's the uncollared lamb. That would be Black 122's lamb, little male. That's Red 18 and her lamb, White 126, and that is Marco. We start in February with our helicopter capture. We round up 25 ewes. The helicopters are bringing them in three, four animals at a time. Fit them with GPS collars as well as vits, which alert us when their lambs are born in the spring. Then we go out and catch their lambs within the first day or so after birth while they're still a little unsteady on their feet while we're able to catch up to them. Determine sex, weight, and then fit them with VHF collars and that allows us to monitor them through the year. 100 to 150 years ago, it was all grazers on this landscape. They were the reason why the Wildcat Hills were the way they were. And so when those sheep were taken out, the landscape changed. Conservation with these bighorn sheep is never done. Bob Smith was the one to introduce me to Gary and Vicki. Well, I'm Vicki Enlow. I'm Gary Enlow. We were more or less kind of high school sweethearts. Sweethearts, yeah. Chem chemistry class. <laughs> William Riley, which is my great-great-grandfather, said the boys wanted to come west. My grandfather, A.J., then settled over in what's called the Squaw Canyon. They were ranchers, so they did cattle and horses, and it was mostly a ranching proposition. I think it went from just uh, living on the land out here with a few cattle in a, in a garden or something, it went to actually 
the beginnings of production in agriculture. What there was to sell out here was grass. Of course, the best means of doing that was through raising cattle. So they've been here a long time. It's been over 100 years. But we live on one of the homestead properties. Our house that's here, the 1914 portion of it, the gamble part of it, that was on uh, her grandmother's homestead. Yeah. I asked them if they wanted to go out on Carter Canyon Ranch and give me a tour of what their life used to be like. I have seen elk herds on the south pasture of Carter Canyon Ranch before. And so I was like, oh, I really hope that they get to see it too, because they told me that they've never seen an elk herd in Nebraska. So I was like, oh, okay, well, cool. We're gonna go to the south pasture. We're gonna, we're gonna go see if that elk herd is round. Spent a lot of time down in this pasture. <laughs> to see elk for quite a long time and Grant spotted some for us so we're, we're taking a good look at them. Beautiful. Well now when people say have you seen the elk oh, out here yeah. we can actually tell them yes we have. <laughs> oh that is so cool. That's kind of a new addition. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a real rarity when we were yeah, they, well, they were gone cows the out there. Yeah, for a long time. Now you just need a few bison. Throw a few bison out here. Everything's here. My son was not interested in ranching. When we initially contacted Prevy, why it was a way of preserving the land, and it was a way of us still having access, as well as our children and grandchildren and children's children and so forth. And we're delighted that we still have open access to hike it or and hunt only, it or whatever. Yeah, it's just. Uh, where we like to be and where we want to be. It's home. The dedicated conservationists with Preby, Nebraska Game and Parks, landowners and ranchers have all made it possible for working landscapes to coexist with wild landscapes. The Wildcat Hills, with the help of these remarkable people, will continue to be resilient and forever wild. So the rest of my written story, along with a few more short films, can be found on PBT's website under the Stories tab. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm Dean Edson, Executive Director for the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts. Uh, my job here in this little short little portion is to introduce the judges for our final competition. I'm going to start to my far right, which would be to your left. 
Um, this is Annette Sudbeck. She's the general manager for the Lewis and Clark Natural Resource Districts. She's worked for the Natural Resource Districts for 10 years. Five, the last five years, she has been the manager, general manager for the district. Next is Alyssa Hamill. She's a course corporate sustainability specialist with Smithsville Foods. She's been with Smithfield for six years. In front of me here to my right is Jim Meiselman. He's the president of the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts. Uh, he's on our board. And he's also been on the board for the Lower Loop NRD for 15 years. Uh, Jim was involved in uh, a dairy operation, owned and operated it. And then um, how, how many years, Jim? 40 plus years. 40 plus years. Um, to my far left and to your right is Brett Weiser. He's the acting state conservationist for Nebraska with NRCS. He's been with NRCS here for 32 years. To my immediate left, to your right, is Tom Riley. He's the director of the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources. Uh, it's a state agency that manages water for quantity purpose. Um, our districts work directly with his agency to coordinate management of groundwater and surface water across the state. Tom's also owner of the Flat Water Engineering Group, um, in a private entity that the NRDs have been affiliated with and utilized to help us develop our management plans, uh, especially when we get into conjunctive water use management. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over. We'll start with our first team, and uh, these are your judges. Good luck to the final three teams. Okay, team 2118, go ahead and unmute yourselves. All right, can you guys hear us? Yes. All right, go ahead and you're, we're good to go. Go ahead, please begin. All right, good afternoon, NRD board members. My name is Jacob. I'm Evan. I'm Penny. I'm Emily. And I'm Sean. And we represent the Groundwater Protection Group, or the GPG. As you are well aware, there's a major issue with nitrate concentrations in the groundwater of this part of Nebraska. Not only can this cause adverse health conditions in people, but it can also signify unsustainable farming practices and the subsequent detriments to nearby habitats and wildlife. Each NRD has already developed a regulatory plan to combat these rising concentrations of nitrate. However, just two of 21 townships in the BGMA have stayed below the maximum contaminant level of 10 parts per million established by the EPA. After carefully evaluating these circumstances of the BGMA, we have developed a unique and effective plan to minimize nitrate concentrations and maintain communal and environmental health. Our primary goal is to protect the well being of all citizens in the BGMA, and we believe our four phase plan will promptly achieve this goal. Now I'm gonna pass it off to my friend, Emily, who's gonna talk about our phase one action plan. Thanks, Jacob. Today I'm gonna to be telling you about the GPG's improvements for the phase one action plan. The nitrate concentration that qualifies a district as being in phase one is between zero and five parts per million. At this point, our goal is maintaining this healthy nitrate level through preventative measures. Our first task was targeting animal feeding operations or AFOs which were only briefly mentioned in previous phase requirements. We found it necessary to address these because these have historically contributed to not only surface water contamination, but also eutrophication and waterborne diseases. According to the EPA, these, have, um, these are responsible for up to 70% of surface water contamination in the US. So farmers that own any medium to large size AFOs will be required to implement and develop a state approved comprehensive nutrient management plan or a CNMP to ensure that natural resource goals are met. This entails proper animal waste management, nutrient application and soil samples to test macronutrient levels and pH, both of which reflect health according to the NRCS. In addition, we plan to require deep soil testing at at least 24 inches deep annually to test for residual nutrients, along with the testing of irrigation water. As far as voluntary actions go, our group will encourage farmers to reduce tillage and use cover crops to leave crop residue on the soil and reduce runoff. Also, we will encourage government and inspection of AFOs to ensure that CNMPs are being properly implemented. 
Evan will now describe the various impacts of the phase one action plan. Thanks, Emily. Phase one actions are mostly voluntary and will cause the slight side effects in the community. No-till and cover crops will make farms more efficient, which leads to less workers being on the farm and less workers have to be paid. These workers can then go on to stimulate some of Nebraska's stagnant industries. According to the EPA, the um, cover crops will reduce the amount of irrigation needed by retaining water in the soil and no-till creates valuable microorganism communities that are often lost due to common tillage practices. Um, in addition, cover crops and crop rotation will mean, means new crops will go to uh, markets, which brings in money to farms already operating at a loss. Uh, preventative measures and constant monitoring will keep the harmful effects of nitrates in the water low, as it'll prevent algal blooms and harmful fish kills. To reduce their harsh effects, AFOs will be encouraged to donate their animal byproducts to farmers, which will reduce the amount of animal manure in the water. In addition, farmers will have to use less synthetic fertilizers, which will also keep the nitrates out of the drinking water. Now, I'll give it off to Sean to discuss phase two. Hi, as previously mentioned, my name is Sean, and I've been tasked with handling demonstration of phase two of our nitrate pollution plan. Phase two begins when a well is measured to have between five and nine parts per million of nitrate. This is the time to kick things into high gear to avoid the EPA set danger level of 10 parts per million. We have decided to move previously mandated phase three and four activities into phase two. These include the requirement to grow cover crops in the off season, as well as prohibiting any single fertilizer application in excess of 60 pounds per acre. These border, one new activity that will be required is the construction of NRD approved field borders. These borders made up of native plants will serve as a primary buffer to excess nitrogen, which might be flowing off of its designated agriculture field. Because surface and groundwater flow towards areas of depression, these field borders should be construct constructed perpendicular to hills and with the contours of the land. These will essentially function as riparian buffers even if they are far away from any immediate surface water. Field borders also offer habitats for birds, pollinators, and other wildlife. Considering all of Upper Elkhorn, Lewis and Clark, and most of Lower Elkhorn NRDs are all measuring for more than nine parts per million, we see the urgency of our phase two plan as being imperative to implement. Another step of phase two is then to engage a fear factor with the people. Free public classes will be hosted to share information about health risks associated with high nitrates in the drinking water. Finally, farmers will be encouraged to use drip irrigation when appropriate instead of conventional sprinkler systems. This will conserve water as well as reduce surface runoff, which could be carrying dissolved nitrates into the surface water. Now, off to my partner, Henry. Thanks, Sean. I'm now going to explain these impacts. The voluntary ac actions of, the fa of phase two will help spread awareness about the harmful effects of consuming excess nitrogen, such as blue baby syndrome. By raising awareness, people will be more likely to support efforts to clean up and prevent excess nitrogen. And they will also have more tolerance for strict policies regarding its overuse. Requiring cover crops is beneficial in almost every way, although they do require a substantial upfront investment. According to the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, by the fifth year of using cover crops, main crop yield increases enough to increase profit. Cover crops also improve soil quality. Legumes replenish soil nitrogen, reducing the need for synthetic fertilizers, which can run off and decimate local water systems and they can increase the amount of soil organic matter, which determines how well the soil can hold nutrients and water. Limiting commercial application of nitrogen fertilizers will prevent runoff of excess fertilizer, which would get into streams and ponds and percolate down to groundwater. While it might decrease crop yields, there are other ways to get nitrogen into the soil. Establishing field borders and riparian zones will help catch and slow runoff, lowering erosion effects 
and helping filter runoff before it reaches surface water. They, also, they will also help house native pollinators, which can increase crop produce. While a lot of this will require an initial investment, in the long run, they will all help work to improve soil and water quality and can even improve production. To help fund these improvements, farmers can receive microgrants from places like the Rodale Institute, which provides grants to small farms aiming for organic farming. I'll now pass it off to Jacob. Thank you, Henry. Phase three will be characterized by nitrate concentrations from nine to 15 parts per million, a slight adjustment from the nine plus PPM that was previously in place. We decided to make this adjustment to better differentiate between phase three and phase four. Over the past 50 years, many regions have progressed into this range of nitrate concentrations due to increased application of fertilizer. In fact, 12 of 21 townships in the BGMA would be considered phase three as of 2017. To attempt to re-lower these nitrate concentrations, phase three will consist of a relatively strict action plan. To begin, farmers must implement an approved two crop rotation plan, which according to the Natural Resource Conservation District will increase organic matter content and decrease runoff. As a result, farmers will enjoy using less fertilizer on their fields. A new regulatory addition in this phase is requiring farmers to realign their fields to farm along the contours of the land. This will also contribute to lower levels of runoff and erosion. Finally, the establishment of new wells is restricted, primarily to avoid over-irrigation and excessive runoff. There are also a few new voluntary actions we plan to implement. Firstly, NRDs are encouraged to begin reverse osmosis plant construction. This costly investment will allow each NRD to effectively separate the nitrate from their drinking water. Sean will have more on this shortly. We also plan to further instigate cooperation between local AFOs and local farms, as Evan mentioned earlier. Through cooperation with AFOs, farms can begin to shift towards more organic fertilizers. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Evan, who's gonna talk about the effects of this action plan. Thanks, Jacob. Phase three actions will be more aggressive and will cause more intense changes in the community. The overall impact will be is shown in the economics as we recommend building four reverse osmosis plants. According to Pure Aqua, a reverse osmosis corporation based in California, each plant will cost about $70,000 each to build and will cost $1 million a year to operate. To pay for these expensive pieces of machinery, we plan to increase taxes and apply for federal and state funds, grants, and loans. Specifically, we plan to apply for the Water Sustainability Fund from the Nebraska DNR and NRC. AFOs will be he more heavily encouraged to donate their animal byproducts to farmers by the way of financial rewards from the government. This will further help to reduce the amount of animal manure in the water and the use of synthetic fertilizers on farms, which in turn will reduce the effect of algal blooms and fish kills in the environment. However, in this phase, social tensions will become more apparent and will start to arise. Specifically, farmers will be placed under more increased strains because they will have to acquire an improved two crop rotation. They will have extremely restricted use of synthetic fertilizers. And in many cases, they'll have to restructure their entire farms according to these new requirements. In addition, people could blame the farmers for their the nitrates in their drinking waters and the increased taxes, which can cause issues on a local political level and other political levels, as well as other social levels in the state. Now I'll pass it off to Sean, who will discuss phase four. Now for phase four. Phase four will be enacted following the discovery of greater than 15 parts per million of nitrogen in the groundwater. At this point, stricter policies are much more necessary. We have decided to recycle some old phase four policies, such as the requirement for farmers to provide receipts as proof of purchase of fertilizer. This will single out and display any particular cases of over application. During phase four, a district approved crop rotation plan will be instituted based on specific cases of over nitrification on farms. 
the GPG has also decided to institute a number of new policies. All farms within phase four areas will be required to obtain fertilizer permits through local NRD offices. Farmers not complying with this rule will be severely penalized. Also, following no rainfall, following rainfall, no irrigation water is to be used up to 24 hours. This will reduce surface runoff, which will prevent extra fertilizer nitrates from leaching into nearby waterways. Phase four also includes a cleanup on the back end of the issue. Although expensive, the GPG has decided that a reverse osmosis system would be, would best, would be the best way to achieve success. With about 1,000 people within each of the four NRDs, we estimate that four reverse osmosis systems should be purchased and installed, specifically models capable of handling up to 130,000 gallons of water per day. This technology being so costly is to be used as crutch in final efforts to maintain communal health. Now off to Henry to elaborate on the means of accomplishing the criteria of phase four. Thank you, Sean. I'm now going to explain the impacts of the phase four policies. Requiring the purchase of permits for use of nitrogen fertilizers will decrease people's use of them because of the increased cost. This also allows limiting the, the amount of fertilizer used in an area by limiting the number of permits sold. People will probably not like this added cost of production, but it will encourage use of environmentally friendly practices such as cover crops and crop rotation. Increasing the penalties so that the parties most responsible for the water pollution will have to bear the brunt of the expenses will prevent parties that are doing what they are supposed to do from being ruined by excessive prices. All of the policies work to prevent excess nitrogen from getting into the, so into the water. While, so that while using reverse osmosis, the water quality can be slowly improved. These facilities are expensive though, so they will be a burden on the community, but serve the important purpose of cleaning up the dangerous nitrogen levels that could impact community health. Grants and loans can be used to pay for these policies. Organizations like the Farm Service Agency provide loans to help farmers maintain their farms and the USDA, HHS, and EPA provide grants that can help farmers or communities build infrastructure, such as that for reverse osmosis. Also, we will maximize the tax efficiency to help provide fund funding. Jacob will take it from here. Thank you, Henry. Alone, our plan can seem a bit unrealistic, but with the help of carefully selected agencies and programs, both public and private, we can make our plan a feasible reality. One of the major points for each of our phases was education. By partnering with the Water Education Foundation, we can provide important classes to farmers on the dangers of nitrate in drinking water and on the most efficient irrigation practices. We can also partner with the agricultural programs of local schools, such as Northeast Community College. These classes can offer the community important knowledge and sustainable farming practices. Another one of our major goals was to make sure all areas have equal access to safe drinking water, regardless of income. Partnering with Earth Justice, an agency that specializes in upholding environment, environmental equality, will ensure that this goal is achieved. The policy changes of our plan took place almost entirely on a local level of law, but Earth Justice can also advocate for policy changes in the Nebraska le legislature giving us more leeway in our ability to enforce regulations. The American Forest Organization is another group we plan to work with. American Forests can help us strengthen windbreaks, which are a common defense mechanism against wind erosion. Planting native trees in these windbreaks will also enhance wildlife in the area. The American Farmland Trust and EQIP both serve a similar function to promote sustainable farming practices. The American Farmland Trust functions by helping individual farmers implement viable practices while EQIP financially incentivizes sustainable farming. By making efficient technology and practices more accessible to farmers, these agencies can help lower the nitrate levels in the groundwater of the BGMA. Emily will take it from here. Thank you. Now, you may be wondering, how do we know if our plan is working? Well, that answer lies within the phase steps themselves. For example, phase one soil test will provide insight into soil properties like pH and nutrients that reflect overall soil health. 
Each phase will require these annual soil tests, as well as the testing of irrigation water to ensure that only the amount of fertilizer that is able to be absorbed by the plants is being applied each year. Because all irrigation water contains salts, which are consequently added to the soil and therefore groundwater with each run, this is essential to require the testing of this water. If districts see a decrease in nitrate levels in the soil as well as irrigation water, they can assume that these steps are effective. In addition, field buffers required in phase two will further contain runoff and the quality of irrigation water will reflect how well that method is working. Moving on, it should be noted that no voluntary actions are available in phase four. At this point, we cannot risk any further groundwater contamination, considering the detrimental effects that this will have on not only drinking water, but also wildlife and aquatic life. Of equal importance is the impact that the cost of implementing this new plan will have on farmers. But with cooperation with agencies like the American Farmland Trust and EQUIP, the financial burden will be greatly reduced and farmers along with community members will receive education. We understand how essential it is for people to know where their water is coming from, no matter where they live. We believe if farmers follow these guidelines alongside the wise use of cover crops, crop rotation, and manure from AFOs, then Nebraska will see a significant decrease in nitrate levels, along with the improvement in farm production. We thank you for listening, and we hope you consider using our sustainable plan. We will not take any questions. As general manager of Lewis and Clark NRD in Hardington, which is one of the NRDs that is in the Bazilli area that you presented on today, I am curious to know a little bit more about how reverse osmosis would be located and what type of water would be sent through the reverse osmosis system and how it would be treated after, where it would be re-injected into, or would it be drinking water, how that would work. plan on using uh, the reverse osmosis system in the plant form in order to add, uh, provide equal access to uh, the greatest number of residents in the NRDs. Um, while you can get your under sink household type uh, reverse osmosis systems, uh, we provide the system once again to cover a broad array of people. Um, as far as the use of the water goes, uh, this would be mainly drinking water. Um, we discussed it, and considering that there are already high nit nitrate in the water, um, there would really not be any point in um, pure any or irrigation water because it could be fertilized in crops. So uh, the purified water would only be designated for uh, drinking. I'm Brent Weiser with the NRCS. Uh, the presenter they presented on the phase two requirements, I believe, had one suggestion there about uh, any fertilizer application not exceeding 60 pounds per acre. My question is, uh, what is the potential benefit of that recommendation? And what is the potential risk or downside for the farmer for that recommendation? So that was me that presented that one. Um, so as far as the pros for that go, um, it would be less uh, leaching of nitrate off of the field and into potential water sources. Um, as far as the downsides for the farmer, um, there could potentially be uh, less productivity for some of the years to come. But uh, the idea of our phase plans is to shift into more of a sustainable approach and through other sustainable practices, which are encouraged with the phase two plan, they could recover and even surpass old production values and re receive higher percent crop yields. All right, thank you. Okay, what factors affect producers and make them resistant to new conservation practices?
Okay, so obviously farmers are already faced um, with extreme time constraints. They're trying to produce uh, enough volume crop to go through market. Um, and weather doesn't always agree with farming. I mean, you're, you're working on a variable schedule. So obviously time is a big factor that can come into play and be an issue with uh, practicing more sustainable things because some of these redesigns of farms such as building with the contour of the land and constructing field borders, these are things that take time and effort and uh, they, they take thought to design. Um, so that, that would be a negative factor going into it. Okay. Also financial uh, part of the problem. You know, a lot of farmers, they don't have uh, just money sitting around where they can pay for these improvements to their fields. So that's why we offer several micro grants for farmers to apply for, and this can help relieve some of that financial tension. And it's understandable for farmers to be reluctant to change their ways because when you've been doing something for so long, you don't want to take a risk. You know that it might not work, that's kind of too expensive. But we don't provide like farmers with the comfort that we will support them financially and that these practices are studied and developed. So you guys mentioned um, annual testing of soil and irrigation water. Who would conduct those tests and how are they being funded? So individual NRDs would conduct the testing for the irrigation water. And the funds for this would be provided by increased taxes, but this would be a marginal increase. We found in our studies that uh, many, of, several of the NRDs are actually using less than half of their taxation power. So obviously without wanting to increase taxes by a significant margin, there is room to play with as far as the financials go for testing. Well, hi, crew. This is Tom Riley, the director of Nebraska DNR. And first of all, congratulations on being uh, one of the three top teams today. That's fantastic work. I heard you talk about working with AFOs and using some of their byproduct and partnering with producers to distribute that product. And I'm wondering how you thought about the handling, distribution, and then ultimately the monitoring of that material on cropland. Okay, so as far as um, encouraging the actual spread of any manure on the fields, um, there would have to be financial incentive to do so. Um, this would have to be done through truck transport. And obviously we've taken into consideration that you'd need certain infrastructure to do this, such as manure spreaders, uh, the trucks to actually take the manure from farm to farm and uh, other equipment to load it. So possible avenues for accomplishing this would be offering um, a communal like a communal pot to put in funds to provide this equipment or possibly rental. This would be something that would have to be decided by the farmer farmers. Um, you could go through a co-op approach to uh, get your hands on this infrastructure or possibly go through grants for the local NRD. And as far as monitoring this cooperation, we plan on using uh, technologies such as drones or GIS that will allow us to uh, just view each farm and make sure they're applying the fertilizers correctly. All right, thank you. I have one, one follow-up question. I know we're running out of time, but uh, you talked about implementing a number of things that have a capital cost associated with it. I heard you say it'd be a million dollars for just the uh, RO processes. How do you handle those costs going out? This is often a forgotten component of design and engineering are the O&M costs, the operation and maintenance.
So we actually researched how much money each NRD was using on water treatment right now. And our proposed reverse osmosis plan, uh, when you compare the two, they were almost equivalent. So right now each NRD was spending about a million dollars on treatment and sometimes more. So our reverse osmosis plants, uh, we've definitely taken into consideration the costs. Thank you. Also, in years going forward, the idea of our phase plant is not to stay in that phase at that intensive regulatory action. The idea, obviously, is to back down in uh, nitrate measures. And so while we may have to pay this premium to try and remediate the resource for several years, eventually this investment should bring the cost down. Okay, thank you guys. If you don't take care of the soil, it's not gonna take care of you, and that's all we've got out here. We don't have coal, we don't have gold or silver, but we got a gold mine in that ground, we just take care of it. Well, I'm Larry Moore, I live up by Ulysses, and I've been on this board since 1975. The reason I got interested in this board was I knew Raymond Burke, one of the original guys that helped put this together, and I worked with him hauling dirt. He didn't like to drive at night, so once in a while I'd be a chauffeur at night to meetings, and I didn't know what they were doing, but I'd go to the meetings, and there'd be Morris Kramer and, and the other senators sitting there talking about something called NRDs. And one day a neighbor came over and asked me if I put my name into the, for a, to be a candidate for the board. So that was in 74, 1974. I got elected and I served in, on that first board I've been on ever since. Have you ever seen that cartoon or that picture about you've been farming along, these two little boys? Well, that was me. I'm one of those boys in that, in that picture. I can't remember when I wasn't on a tractor with a dad. Mom was always saying, take that boy with you. So I got to go a lot of places. I got really interested in soil conservation first because my uncle had graduated from university in 1941. And then he got drafted to service when he came back for World War II. Then he went to work for the Soil Conservation Service, and that was his career. So that's where I got interested, because he got me started on it. I guess when I really became aware of it was in 1956, we were drilling an irrigation well, and I wasn't very old, 14, I think. Ray Burke got me around the test well, and they were drilling down 275 feet, checking for water, and he started pulling out these soil samples over 10 feet all the way down. And that's the first time I really thought about all the different things there are as you go down. I didn't really give it a thought. I just thought, you know, it's the same all the way down here. It was this sand and yellow clay and red clay and blue clay and rocks. And I, it just really opened my eyes up to that. After that, I guess I just stayed interested and I've been real lucky in life. I've been able to farm all my life and I wanted to be involved in conservation work. I've been able to do, all, do that all my life. So not too often you get to do both things you want to do. Since we started in this district, we've tripled the number of irrigated acres in this district and we're still pumping the same amount of water we were 1965 and growing twice as much corn. And that's just kind of the way the farming's gone, gone and that's why I've stayed interested in it. And the next generation coming up is gonna do a lot better job than we are because they don't know any different. What I've enjoyed most about this board is the education I've gotten from it. Just with these meetings, I've had a chance to, to sit in with people from Lincoln, from, from all sources of areas. I've had the opportunity to go to national conventions, be educated, I've had a chance to go to Washington, D.C. and even testify for Congress and things that I would have never done otherwise. And you learn about how to get along with people too. I just enjoy it so much that it's almost embarrassing sometimes I get paid for it. It's like the old cartoon, but now they call me a conservationist. Uh, it's just the way I was raised and I hope I've raised my family the same way. Jim and Mary Ann Wartman grew up in farming families in northeast Nebraska. They have both served as directors on their local NRD board and at the statewide level. Through the NRD's conservation tree program, they have planted shelter belts and a living snow fence on their farm outside of Crofton. The county approached us about putting some trees in and they request that you put it back like 200 yards from the road 
in order to stop the snow from uh, accumulating on the road. We planted them. They were just little bitty seedlings. And then we put weed berry around it. The tree was a little bit in the middle and they had that weed berry around the outside, this big around, which would grow with weeds. So consequently, we would come out here and we would weed that. When we first moved out here and when we were first married, I was a 22-year-old bride. And we were out in the living shelter belt weeding those little bitty trees. And I remember looking at Chris and you know, tears rolling down my face, going, oh, I didn't think this was what marriage was. It's so hard and so much work. And <laughs> it, was a, and it was a job. Since the NRDs began in 1972, there have been more than 95 million trees and shrubs planted across the state through the NRD Conservation Tree Program. It's great habitat, there are pheasants in there, there are all kinds of wildlife in there, and it's been, it's been a good thing for the farm. Trees also provide shade and protection for homes, reduce energy costs, prevent soil erosion, and improve water and air quality. But in ranch country, too many trees can have a negative impact on grassland for cattle. Our place that we operate on has been in our family 125 years, and uh, I guess that resource management is something that's been a top priority. In the Upper Niobrara White Natural Resources District, helping landowners with trees is one of their main activities. We're constantly trying to educate people on the put the right tree in the right spot, where it'll grow, where it's native to, how far apart to space it, how close the rows can be together, just to make sure you get the best survivability you can. Two years ago, we did this used to be our East Cedars pasture and and uh, we've, we've cleared it out almost completely. There's still a few popping around, but that's an ongoing project and um, a concern here. All over the state, there's about 40,000 acres a year of expansion of those cedar tree growths, particularly in central eastern Nebraska. Nothing grows underneath them. Um, you know, they're taking water and nutrients from, from the ground. And every time that we've cleared an area, we've seen significant improvement. You've got to keep that manageable to where it's a, a, a kind of a proper mix between the trees. The cows like the shade, <laughs> and I like them too, but you've got to keep the right mix. And that pasture, the whole thing is just lifted by now. And, that's... and your pastures all look, look very good. Oh, thanks. We... Natural resources districts are always working with landowners to mitigate negative human impact on the environment. They also contend with the impacts of natural forces like fire and wind. Pine Ridge came to be known famous for its pine trees. We get very little moisture out here. We, soils are pretty shallow and there's not a lot of nutrients, so it takes a long time to get a tree established. Behind me is the aftermath of the 2012 wildfires. During the fires in 2012, we had 1,000 acres on our ranch burn. Kind of difficult to deal with, mainly because those trees, they kind of become a part of you when you and uh, in and around and under them all your life. And all of a sudden, all they are is a, a black stem standing there. The district has really worked with landowners to put trees back onto the landscape. It took a long time for the Pine Ridge to get to where it was, and it's going to take a long time to get it back into that condition. On the Ridenar Ranch in the Upper Loop Natural Resources District, their fate can change with the wind. This is a true Nebraska Sandhills blowout. We are on sand dunes just because they have cover on them. You know, the early settlers say when they first came, the tops of the hills were all bare. This sugar sand that we're standing in blows very easily, so it doesn't take much for it to be whipping around. An opening from a Bull hole, cow trail, road, anything will start to blow out. And that's the main goal we have here is to try to stop this from happening all over the place. And if it is happening to re make it recover. The NRD was crucial in the initial phase of setting up our rotational grazing. They helped us realize that 
the plants need time to recover. Before that, we would graze the cows in each pasture from May till end of October, and the grasses would never recover. The windmill areas would always be beaten down because cows were coming in constantly every day. And so they were very helpful in opening our eyes up to different ways of how to manage the place. People will ask, you know, how many acres you have? Well, that's not the question. The question is, how many acres does it take to raise a cow? So that's the key there. You have to know the limits of what it can do. With help from the Upper Loop NRD Education and Cost Share programs, the Ridden Hours implemented rotational grazing. They fence smaller pastures and move the cattle more often. That gives the grass more time to recover. This blowout we're standing in used to be 20 times the size it is now. Hopefully in another 20 years, it will all be grass. elevated nitrate levels. The EPA has set the maximum contaminant level for nitrates at 10 parts per million. 14 out of 21 townships in your area had nitrates exceeding this threshold. Currently, it is being managed under four different groundwater management plans because it is a part of four different NRDs. You have tasked us with developing a singular cohesive groundwater management plan that is both sustainable and adds three new ideas. Today we will address the four phases of groundwater rules and regulations, soil health and nitrogen testing, social impacts and well decommissioning, livestock management and environmental impacts, and education, partnerships, and the economic impact of our plan. If there are any words, comments, or phrases that we use in today's presentation that are unfamiliar to you, we encourage you to ask us about those in the question time at the end. With that, let's get started. So obviously I do not have enough time to address each and every rule and regulation of every phase of our plan. So I'll be hitting the highlights and my colleagues will be expanding on those later. Let's start with phase one. The trigger for phase one is whenever nitrates are between zero and five parts per million. These are mainly going to be voluntary regulations because it's only phase one. This would include some things like discouraging fall and winter application of fertilizers, encouraging yearly testing of private wells, and recommending deep soil testing. The trigger for phase two is when nitrates are between 5.1 and 8.9 parts per million. This is gonna include all the rules and regulations from phase one, and it'll also add some new things like irrigation water must be tested every four years. We would discourage putting fertilizer on fields in excess of need. And then number three is we would have required livestock exclusion, vegetative treatment systems, and pasture management for animal feeding operations. Now it's important to remember that we can only regulate AFOs. We have no power over smaller operations. So that is why we did not include them in this stage of this phase. Moving on to phase three. The trigger for phase three is when nitrates are between nine and 10 parts per million. This would include all previous phase requirements and would add some new things such as encouraging pre and post cropping reports irrigation water must be tested every two years, and sensors and monitors are encouraged in cropping fields. Finally, phase four. Phase four is whenever nitrates are 10 or above, or if an area has been in phase three for three consecutive years. This would include all previous phase requirements and would add some other things, such as requiring pre and post cropping reports, requiring those sensors and monitors in cropping fields, and having mandatory decommissioning of abandoned wells. We understand that some of these regulations are strict and will have some associated cost, but you must consider the cost of doing nothing. And you must also think about potential health problems that could arise from having such high nitrate levels. Thank you. Now, please turn your attention to Nathan. Thank you, Sydney. I'll be discussing different aspects of erosion and leaching control, fertilizer application, and irrigation management. But first, I'm gonna talk about how all those different things relate to our main problem, which is nitrogen pollution. 
Erosion and runoff take nitrogen from sediment and fertilizer and wash it into nearby surface water and water bodies. According to an NRCS report, for every ton of soil eroded, there contains a little over two pounds of nitrogen within it. When you consider that each cultivated acre of cropland could have between two and five tons per acre per year being eroded, and urban land has much higher numbers than that, between four and 16 tons per acre per year, that is a lot of nitrogen being carried and just run on. Leaching is also a major concern, especially with the sandy texture soils called enthesols in this area. With all the irrigation water being applied, it is very easy for nitrogen to leak straight through this sandy soil into nearby groundwater and surface water. So in order to prevent this, we have implemented a number of different practices into our plan that will help control runoff and leaching as much as possible. In the latter phases, we're requiring BMPs like field and pasture land borders, grass waterways and diversions, riparian buffers, irrigation management, and integrated soil testing. In phase four, we're requiring the use of year-round ground cover, which for most operations means they must use a cover crop. A cover crop or any kind of ground cover for that matter will certainly do a lot to prevent erosion and leaching and it'll also naturally add nutrients like nitrogen back to the soil, reducing the amount of fertilizer that these farmers have to use. We will encourage many uh, landowners to restore their land into prairie grass, which has many of the same benefits as these other BMPs and also acts as great wildlife habitat. We're implementing strict regulations on the use of fertilizer because if it is not used properly, and for many of these operations it's not, it can contaminate our water and reduce crop production in the long run. The most notable regulation we're implementing on this is re prohibiting the use of fertilizer in the excess of need. Now, that might be confusing at first, but what we simply mean by that is that every large operation, a crop producer, golf course, company along, anywhere where they're putting a large amount of fertilizer out, they must submit a soil test into the NRD. And after determining nutrient levels and other aspects of soil health, the NRD, not the landowner, will determine how much fertilizer is necessary to be used for the, what they're wanting to use it for. The landowner is completely pro prohibited from using anything extra. Now that might be a strict regulation, but it'll certainly do a lot to prevent over fertilization and nutrient pollution. We're implementing regulations on the use of irrigation water as well which will not only help with the leaching of nutrients, but also conserve groundwater, which, especially in our area, is a pretty finite resource. In the latter phases, or in phase four, we're requiring all irrigators to install advanced irrigation monitoring and technology that will help track soil moisture and help farmers understand how much irrigation water is needed on their fields. And they'll also use a flow meter to measure how much irrigation water is being applied. Now, this is a very expensive step. According to USDA, USDA, it can cost between $12 and $1,300 per acre, but we believe it's a necessary step in order for many of these farmers and other operations to become more sustainable. Because it is so expensive, we hope and will encourage many of our crop producers to transition their land into a, a dry land farming technique, which has many of the same benefits or has uh, and which can still be productive. Remember that 8% of the total crop production in our area is done with dryland farming. Thank you for your time. Now please give your attention to Alex. Thank you, Nathan. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Pope and today I'm going to be elaborating on groundwater and surface water interactions and how this affects water quality, well decommissioning and its potential benefits and social and cultural issues caused by our proposed plan. So first, let's start off with groundwater and surface water interactions. Groundwater and surface water interact several times during the hydraulic cycle, but mainly when precipitation falls from the, falls from the clouds, it runs over the land and it can either infiltrate and will run into a nearby water body, but it also can infiltrate into soil and become groundwater and an aquifer. Humans have created a structure called wells to tap into this aquifer and make water available. The tendency for contaminants to move between groundwater and surface water is a key consideration when managing water bodies for water quality. 
My team and I have considered this when creating the groundwater rules and regulations for the Brazil management, groundwater management area. One new idea that we want to bring to the table is well decommissioning. Decommissioning of wells will be done by local professionals at your natural resource districts. When decommissioning wells, things like pumping equipment, valves, pipelines, oil, debris, and other form material will be removed, as well as casings, liners, and screens, unless they're impractical to extract. This information was researched by the Natural Conservation Services in an article titled Water Well Decommissioning. We suggest that you decommission a well if it is within a hundred yards of a sediment basin or vegetative treatment area. But in phase four of our plan, we require that you decommission an abandoned well if your area reaches above 10 parts per million of nitrate. By decommissioning wells in these two cases, we can limit the potential risk for nitrates having a straight shot to an aquifer and contaminating groundwater. My team and I also want to say that we understand the social and cultural issues caused by our proposed plan, and we want to address this feedback. One interest group that we are looking at is owners and users of these wells. They could be potentially using a water source, and we also have to think about the cost of clean drinking water rising. To treat drinking water for nitrate contaminants in the Brazil groundwater management area is over the past 20 years is over $9 million. We not only want to limit this cost, but address it with our rules and regulations. In phase one, we are offering a public town meeting to address the public on the rising nitrate problem and also the rules and regulations to fix it. This meeting will also address the farm versus public agenda. Farming practices are the ones to create the pollution most of the time, but farmers aren't the ones to realize it. People downstream neighbors or groundwater cities pulling from groundwater are realizing it. And lastly, we want to say that we want to prioritize that everyone has a right to clean and healthy water, no matter where they live, if they own or don't own property or the income they make. Thank you and please turn your attention to Ellie. Hello, my name is Ellie Jones and I'm going to be talking about the livestock management aspect of the Brazil groundwater management area rules and regulations plan and the effects that livestock can have on the environment. So to get started, my main points today will be vegetative treatment areas, which are recommended in phase one and required in phases two, three and four buffers and aquatic habitat. So let's get started. What are vegetative treatment areas and what do they do? Well, a vegetative treatment system is an economical and environmentally friendly approach to managing nutrient runoff from barnyards and feedlots. They capture runoff from the feedlots and apply them to a permanently vegetated area to prevent nutrient runoff. In Nebraska, storage basins are designed to hold a 25 year, 24 hour storm expected solids accumulation, and about a foot of extra storage called freeboard. What a 25 year, 24 hour storm event means is the maximum precipitation in 24 hours with a probable reoccurrence of once in 25 years. The stored runoff is then drained or pumped out of the storage basin onto a perennial forage crop and can be applied by a variety of irrigation equipment. The stored runoff carries nutrients for crop growth, which are absorbed by the forage and then refed through the operation. Vegetative treatment systems can help prevent leaching of nutrients into the soil, which could negatively affect water quality. This helps farmers manage nitrogen and phosphorus so that it's being used in a positive way. Up to 80% removal of waste can be expected depending on design use. This helps reduce the potential for nitrate contamination in the groundwater. VTAs can also help save farmers costs on feed and fertilizer. We do recommend testing the affluent and the soil just to make sure that the nutrient needs line up. Systems use the first few feet of soil to capture the nutrients until they can be absorbed by vegetation. According to the article, the benefits of a vegetative treatment area on your livestock operation. Now on to buffers. In Nebraska, the best placement for buffers is a grass tree grass placement. This helps reduce windblown sediment and provide favorable wildlife habitat. We recommend using a wide variety of grass tree and shrub species, focusing on those with a high wildlife value 
and on native species. We also want to include pollinator habitat. When placed beside water, buffers can help trap sediment, filter out pollutants, provide detritus for the base of the aquatic food chain, and shade the water. Aquatic habitats are very important in the interaction of surface water and groundwater. Since all the streams in the Buzzle groundwater management area are gaining streams, this means that they are recharged by groundwater. So by protecting groundwater resources, we are also protecting our aquatic ecosystems. Taking measures to prevent surface water pollution will reduce the potential for groundwater contamination and aquatic habitat destruction, while also showing that agriculture can be sustainable and productive. Thank you and turn your attention to Josie. Thank you, Ellie. Hello, my name is Josie Freeman, and today I will be talking about education, economic impacts, and political issues. The first thing I'd like to talk about is education. Our two main concerns with this are farmer involvement and educating the next generation. We would like to help farmers understand that they can be environmentally conscious. So we would like to have champions or project farms that showcase environmentally conscious agricultural practices and prove that environmentally conscious farming can be done. We would like to have our champions or project farms offer host guided tours and training sessions to show how their farms and incomes have benefited from these practices, as well as showing other farmers how to implement these practices in their own farms, farmer to farmer. We would also like to have public meetings and education days to educate the public about environmentally conscious agricultural practices what they are and how to implement them in their own farms on a level the whole family can understand. Which leads into my next topic, educating the next generation. The next generation is the future of farming, so educating them is crucial. We would like to have yearly essay, poster, and debate contests on environmentally conscious agricultural practices, as well as getting involved with the local FFA. Now I know what you might be thinking, who's gonna help me pay for all these practices I'm now implementing? Well, the USDA offers many cost share programs to help farmers get things paid for. Programs like the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, the Agricultural Management Assistance Program, and the Agricultural Easement Program. They also offer farm loans like micro loans and operational loans. We can also look into partnerships like the Nebraska Farm Business Incorporated, which are able to provide knowledge to farmers and ranchers with their business planning, financial analysis, and tax preparation. Now, something I'm sure you've all been thinking about is political issues. Issues like administrative order and pushbacks from organizations that may be affected by these regulations can really stall our fight against nitrate pollution. We want to do our best to keep all parties satisfied, and we're looking for options and ideas on how to avoid things like administrative order, which as defined by the EPA is a legal document signed by the EPA ordering an individual, business, or other entity to take corrective action or refrain from activity. It describes the violations and actions to be taken and can be enforced in court. We would also like to avoid hurting organizations like the Nebraska Department of Agriculture and the Nebraska Farmers Union. We would like to partner with these organizations and others to conserve the land for the next generation. Thank you for your time and please turn your attention over to Sydney. Thank you, Josie. So one of your main goals was adding three new ideas to the groundwater management plan. The three new ideas that we have discussed today have been prohibiting the use of nitrogen fertilizer beyond NRD recommendations, decommissioning abandoned wells, and requiring vegetative treatment areas. So in conclusion, today we have addressed the four phases of groundwater rules and regulations, soil health and nitrogen testing, social impacts and well decommissioning, livestock management and environmental impacts, and education, partnerships, and the economic impact of our plan. We are confident that our plan is sustainable and keeps your goals, farmers, and public health in mind. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. These were our resources. And we will now accept any questions that you have. Lewis and Clark, NRD out of Hardington, Nebraska, which uh, we encompass or include part of the Bazil groundwater management area, as you know. So this is very uh, inter or interesting for me to hear the suggestions you have, have made. 
Um, you've done a great job getting here, team. Um, one of my main questions is for converting to uh, year-round cover or grass um, in phase four. How would you propose paying for the loss income to the producers or what is there a loss income to the producers at that transition? How would you propose m moving ahead with that practice? So the only loss of income, well, not necessarily income, or maybe cost to that would actually be seeding a cover crop of any kind. But for most producers, especially when you're talking about crop producers, the benefits would far outweigh the negative part of it because you're you're keeping soil health, uh, you're, you're uh, upgrading soil health, you're adding nutrients back to the soil, reducing the amount of fertilizer you have to use, you're increasing biodiversity, which can help with um, pest cycles and all those different things. So you don't have to use as much pesticides. So for it, it may cost a little bit to seed a cover crop of some kind into a crop field, but it would certainly not lower your profit or gain very much at all, if any, it probably help you. It probably bring more profit to these operations, especially in the long run. And if I could just add on to what my colleague Nathan said, um, a lot of times with these cover crops, you're gonna leave them in the soil and you're either gonna roll them or um, keep that on the soil, but you can also use the option of harvesting that cover crop in some cases. So it may actually be a profit to the farmer to have these cover crops in addition to having those environmental benefits um, as far as soil health goes. I have one follow-up question with that. It was re recommended to convert to prairie grass, um, which would result in a change at least in the income. And I was wondering how that would be addressed. So obviously for, if you go, you know, if you're a crop producer and you have a field full of corn and you convert it to prairie grass, you're not going to be making very much money off of that corn, uh, off of what you were, you know, in comparison. But prairie grass, uh, prairie grass state, there are incentive programs for that. There are incentive programs that actually pay for those producers to convert that land into prairie grass. And um, for marginal land that maybe production was very low on anyway, it is a very good idea. And perhaps after many years of using or uh, converting it back to prairie grass, it may be uh, the soil health may be a whole lot better later on down the road. So it's, it's not necessarily, when you're doing something like that, you're not necessarily looking at profit as much as benefits to, um, you know, your ecosystem, benefits to soil health, um, groundwater, the conservation, all those other benefits that go along with it. This is Britt Weiser with NRCS. And you mentioned uh, in your presentation about uh, uh, one of the recommendations was pre and post crop reports. Could you give me a little more detail of what would be in those uh, reports and how would you use the information? So one of the ways that we would use the pre and post cropping reports would be to gauge at what level of fertilizer or nutrients are being applied to the farmer's fields. So we do want to have a good idea of how much nitrogen, especially, you know, those nitrates are being applied to the field so that we can better manage that in future years. And also it's great to have data as far as these farmers who are using these practices, how is it going for them? Is it reducing the nitrate levels in the area? So it's good for us to have that information and it's also good for the farmer to have an idea of how their fields are doing. Okay, I'm uh, Jim Eshelman and I'm president of the State Association and I'm also a NRD board member. Uh, can you explain why it's difficult for NRD board members to enact new rules and regulations? Well, there's multiple reasons of course, as you know. Um, one of the reasons can be pushback from farmers and producers that maybe they feel threatened by the new rules and regulations. That's something we really want to think about because we are dealing with people and people can easily feel threatened or maybe even sometimes offended if you don't go about putting enacting rules and maybe even wording. Um, so we really would just like to educate as much as possible and then hopefully regulations are more of a last resort thing. 
And if I could add on to what Josie said, one of the main things that we would probably get pushed back on is with the cost because you know farmers they're the lifeblood of a lot of communities and they're doing the best they can right now um, so that would be a big thing that we could get pushed back on would be the cost of this plan but as Josie said in her portion she said that there are several cost share programs available and this is also going to be helping farmers in the long run to maybe not necessarily have more crops but you're going to have higher quality with less investment so overall you're going to be saving farmers money if you follow through with this plan and another thing that we want to do is that in the to help with those pushbacks is that in the first phase is we most of the practices are voluntary. So as Josie said, you know, we want to educate and hopefully get farmers to voluntarily realize that I need to do these practices. So maybe less regulations as you go down the road. Hi, I'm Alyssa with Smithfield Food Sustainability. Um, could you guys elaborate on why NRDs are the best management authority for managing these nitrate issues? Well, NRDs are locally elected the board, as y'all know. So they really know what's going on in the community and know some of the localized issues that are happening. And if I can elaborate on that, most of these people that are on the NRD board live in the community. And sometimes when you bring in people from other areas that don't live right in the community, they can really take the people out of it and just think about achieving their goals. Why team, this is Tom Riley, director of Nebraska DNR. Congratulations for getting here today. Uh, a super job and a good presentation in general. I like that you talked about the surface water and groundwater interactions are both important in this basin. Um, I'm a hydrologist at heart. That's what I have done most of my career. So I've got a question related to that. And maybe just one clarification as you go forward in your career. You, you talked about a uh, one in 25 year event um, that you have to store water for. And those don't actually occur every one in 25 years. That's the 4% chance of any one year. So. Um, that's okay, that's what most people look at it. Same way with a 100-year storm, it's the 1% chance in any one year. So I've got kind of a two-part question, and it relates to the hydrologic cycle, which you also talked about. And the first is this. On those storage structures, what if I were to tell you that they're designed to leak? That they do control surface water, but they're designed to leak water, uh, in that we just probably can't design them to store it all. And, and with that, and this idea of a 25-year storm, 4% chance, um, we all understand that there is some kind of change. Some people might call it climate change. I call it non-stationarity. There's a change in the averages. It's raining more and more intensely. How do some of your thoughts address that change over time? So certainly one of the things that we do need to think about is with climate change or things not being stable is that there are going to be more dramatic weather events. So whether that's greater amounts of precipitation, things like that, that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind with this plan is that while we have these vegetative treatment areas and they are designed to hold this amount of water, we may have to rethink some of that into the future and think about some better ways to, to manage more water and think about how things might change in the future because of climate change or our environment not being as stable. And to add on to what Sydney said, by putting in other best management practices, we're really reducing the chance for that leakage to harmfully affect the groundwater. So having all of these BMPs work together, instead of it just being one last hope for the vegetative treatment areas, we're having all of these things work together so that they're all reducing that. All right, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gary Eberly. Uh, I've been at the NRD, this will be my 24th year. I was elected in 97. I'm a retired farmer, and I got interested in running for the NRD 
I was on the York County Groundwater Board for way over 10 years. And so I got interested because a couple board members insisted that I run. Ever since I got on and everything, I've had a great deal of compassion and everything for the goals of the NRD. Basically, water conservation is probably one of the biggest highlights. And I've served various offices and everything on the NRD. Treasurer, vice chairman, and NRD representative. I, I do think I was an innovator, yes. I started conservation back in the late 70s with water meters. Back then, that was a tool that nobody thought was very necessary. After using it, I noticed that it was necessary to budget water. And then also that evolved into soil moisture blocks for calculating when to irrigate. And this all evolved before I got into the NRD, but once I got into the NRD, it just kind of exploded to a certain degree because I knew that we can do this. We can conserve water. Then it developed into water quality. And so those two things, quantity and quality, have been my interest ever since I've been on the board. In 1974, there was a project we did in the Benedict area. It's called the Benedict Project, where we metered our water and tried to get along with 16 inches. Now, that was a long time ago and we were able to do it. Well, all those meters that went on, people said, well, that's okay. Well, it wasn't okay. I decided to keep doing it. So I ended up putting meters on everything and finding out how much I used. And then when the soil moisture blocks could regulate, you know, tell us exactly what moisture was in the soil, then we could start managing our water. You've got to, it's a resource, it was given to us. That water down there got put there a long, long time ago. Look what happened in the Dust Bowl areas. If we would have had conservation back then, maybe things would have been better. Right now, with our increase in our water table, you tend to be comfortable. Well, we shouldn't be comfortable. We should always be alert to the fact that somewhere down the road, we could have a stretch of dry 10 years in a row. And if we hadn't have started conserving in the beginning of that 10 years, then we'd be thinking of a lot of different areas. Agriculture in Nebraska and conservation is our future. We shouldn't just look at the present, we should look down the road. I do hope that the Nebraska conservation will continue. Farmers and ranchers constantly strike a balance between economic forces that can vary year to year and the welfare of the land that sustains us all far into the future. My dad was probably one of the, as far as a steward of the land, he didn't have a lot of uh, corn on corn. He, he had a lot of rotation with uh, small grains and put clover in behind oats for green fertilizer, that type of thing. So I grew up with it. In 1952, we, we started terracing and uh, just did one field first and then, and then continued on until the whole farm was, was under a conservation practice. The Wartman family has witnessed the evolution in conservation practices on their farm and in their district. The terrace has just held the water up and uh, we could tell you know, on the yields that we were getting better yields by doing that. Chris and Holly Wartman both work off the farm, but the prospect of passing it on to their daughters is important to them. This family farm is a testament to the monumental changes in farm practices in the last 40 years. I just see that as a, just in the last, well, 20 years, 25 years since I was helping out here as a kid. So it, it's changed. Uh, immensely. We farmed with mostly two row equipment uh, and w when we quit we were doing four row. I was out at Husker Harvest Days. They had a 48 row corn planter out there. Yeah. I could, most of my fields you wouldn't have been able to turn around with it. <laughs> it was so, they're so huge. The management approach to farming, I think, is more difficult today than it was 50 years ago because we're dealing with such tighter margins. We're dealing with more money. Uh, so if you're not a sharp manager, sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. 
The margins have also tightened in terms of groundwater quantity and quality. Those factors have driven innovation as much as the economics of agriculture. Post World War II, when commercial fertilizers really came available, they were cheap. A lot of guys poured it on. If, if uh, a little is good, a lot is better type mentality. Nitrogen fertilizer and herbicides delivered on their promise of increased reliable yields. Heavy tilling coupled with chemical application were the preferred methods for weed control and crop production. There were contests to see who could make it the blackest because you didn't want anything on the top of the ground, and which was just a 100% wrong thing to do. But that was the way it was farmed for, for years and years. What was lost in that was the value of the crop residue, or stubble, that helps prevent wind erosion and puts nutrients back into the soil. The timing and amount of water used are also key. If we have high rates of recharge on the land and we over-irrigate, uh, we're running that water past the root zone. If we have over-fertilized or the plants haven't used nitrogen, it's flushing that nitrogen down into what we call the Vado zone, which is between the bottom of the root zone and the top of the aquifer. And once they're below the root zone, there's, the only way they're coming back is through pumping that groundwater and bringing, bringing them back to the surface to be used. We realized some of the things, our practices back in the 60s and early 70s uh, were not the best management practices that were out there. And it, it created some problems uh, for the next generation to try to correct. In northeast Nebraska, the Bazil Groundwater Management Project is a multi-partner collaboration working to address nitrate problems. It's in an area that's uh, part of four NRDs, uh, Upper Elkhorn and Lower Elkhorn and the Lower Nibera and Lewis and Clark. The Bazil Creek drains the whole area. We've known for the last 20 years that there's been a nitrate contamination problem in that area. We've kind of leveled off, but it's, it's still there and we can't turn the corner to where we get groundwater clean again. With that cooperative effort, we're hoping that in years to come we can get the nitrogen to be lowered and get the, the producers in this area to also understand they're a part of the solution to this problem. We learn something every day, that's, that's for sure. Dave Condon has worked with the Upper Elkhorn NRD over the years to implement best management practices on his farm outside of Creighton. We started out with uh, doing a little no-till on some of our uh, dry land ground that was maybe tougher ground that I would say, and uh, that was probably eight to ten years ago we started doing that. We've just progressed a little bit each year, and uh, this year um, I was 100% no-till on, on all my acres. The NRDs offer training and education in conservation practices, cost share programs, and incentives to help ag producers invest in improvements and new technologies. When trying something new, cost share usually attracts uh, people. A lot of folks, uh, when they're done with harvest, can actually seed a cover crop, another growing crop on top of the residue. Uh, turnips, tillage radishes, and um, Australian winter peas learning how cover crops can hold up nitrates or produce nitrates that uh, you don't have to put it out there yourself and probably more stable nitrates. So that, that caught my interest. I think it's a radish. That's a radish. I, the sure. farmers are doing a great job, we think. You know, even with the economics of uh, the commodity prices right now, they have to very closely manage their, their applications of irrigation water, their fertilizer applications. And then the wheat came back on its own. A lot of it would be bottom line, too, of if I can produce nitrates myself and not buy them and haul them out there, that, that really caught my interest. Should be out doing something else, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm learning along with, with you guys. So. This year we, we cooperated with the purchasing the Optrix unit. He's always uh, looking for ways to yeah. utilize that nitrogen fertilizer the best. And so uh, we just jumped on board with him. You know, he wanted to try this out. And so we said, you know, we'll help you out with that. This technology analyzes soil characteristics to optimize nitrogen application. What we're doing is we're looking at the color of the corn as we move through the field 
a greener color would indicate a healthier plant. This is just continuously looking at plants and adjusting the rate that this unit is putting out on the corn. They're concerned about water quality, you know, and, and they want to do what they can to, to help, but it's got to be something that, you know, will keep farming uh, profitable, but also help with the environment. Mostly they've been real willing on it. I'm not sure that we've reached all of them yet. And that's why we're doing a concentrated effort with the four NRDs. Hopefully we can get to a point where the problem is reversed. Education and cost share programs have helped ag producers become more efficient in their resource management than ever before. Still, in communities across the state, natural resources districts are dealing with the legacy of farming practices of the past century. In 1987, uh, the district approved, it was the very first groundwater management plan in, in Nebraska for, for uh, quality. The EPA has set limits on maximum contaminant levels for safe drinking water. MCLs are measured in milligrams per liter or parts per million. The MCL for nitrates is 10 parts per million. When nitrate levels approach or exceed safe limits, the NRDs implement a four-phase regulatory structure under each phase designation, increasing regulations apply. We do have a large area of our district that's in a phase two and phase three area. We require them to do soil samples, water samples, and, and write down their expected crop yields and, and what their actual crop yield was. Then they can calculate how much they have in the soil that is present for the next crop, and then how much do they need to add to that to get the yield goal that they're really shooting for. It's an educational process is what it is to, to make them realize that there is a, a recommendation out there of how much nitrogen should be applied to a crop and, and uh, we just want them to be aware of it before they make that decision. The first line of groundwater defense is education and those efforts in the Central Platte District are slowly paying off. I know going from, from nearly 20 parts per million to 14 parts per million from 1987 to 2015 doesn't seem like a lot. But when you figure that uh, we started applying nitrogen in this area probably in the 30s and 40s, um, we didn't get to where we were overnight. It may have taken 20 years to, to have that nitrogen move into the system. It may take 40 years for it to get it completely out of the system. Okay. I give you a cue. You guys are good to go. Go ahead. Good afternoon, NRD board members. The great state of Nebraska has a slogan. It's so much more than meets the eye. While this is true for Nebraska's prairies and farmland, it also describes the essential groundwater resources that lie beneath. The Ogallala Aquifer, which supplies most of Nebraska's water, is a shallow, unconfined aquifer recharged by precipitation and meltwater. Due to the permeable Great Plains soil and lack of confining layer, the aquifer is extremely susceptible to pollution. In fact, Nitrate contamination from commercial fertilizers increased 28% from 2003 to 2017 in Nebraska alone, and the trends continue to rise. In 2018, the Nebraska Public Water Supply Program reported that nitrate contamination affects almost 33,000 Nebraskans. One area of particular concern is the Bazille Groundwater Management Area, or BGMA. Located in northeast Nebraska, it covers four natural resource districts, is comprised of 21 townships, and sustains 10 municipalities and 7,000 area residents. Within the BGMA, groundwater is the primary drinking water supply, yet 14 of the 21 townships exceed the maximum contaminant level of 10 parts per million for nitrates. <clears throat> According to the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts, Nebraska's unique natural resource district, or NRD system, is responsible for the development, management, use, and conver conversion of ground and surface water. Therefore, it is our responsibility as NRD professionals to ensure that the BGMA has a clean, sustainable water supply for the future. We have developed a comprehensive set of groundwater rules and regulations for landowners and other stakeholders in the region. Our plan is divided into four phases based on the level of nitrate in the groundwater. Each township in the management area will be placed in the phase that corresponds to the average level of nitrate in its groundwater. We have chosen the nitrate triggers to meet the increasing magnitude of the problem 
and to comply with the federal standard of 10 ppm for drinking water quality. All rules and regulations from each phase will continue to apply in all subsequent phases. Phase one of our regulations will include any townships with average nitrate levels up to 5 ppm. One way our plan is unique is we believe collaboration and education is key to success. Therefore, phase one will emphasize collaboration among interest groups, education for farmers and other residents, and assessment of ground and surface water. We encourage all townships to form advisory committees made up of local farmers, businesses, resource professionals, representatives from municipalities, and any other interest groups. These committees would meet regularly to discuss concerns or conflicts and to steer local water management. We also urge all farmers in the BGMA to attend programs offered by the four NRDs to learn about nitrate contamination and water protection. Since children are our future leaders and policymakers, we encourage townships to offer safe water awareness programs in local schools and to take advantage of the NRD's nationally known environmental education program. Through these measures, we can ensure voluntary cooperation with our protection initiatives and reduce the cost and effort associated with mandatory regulations. One simple assessment tool we suggest for farmers is the University of Nebraska's CropWatch, a platform that provides data on crop water requirements, recent precipitation, soil infiltration rates, and evapotranspiration rates. Using this information, growers can calculate their irrigation water requirements, reduce nitrate leaching from excess irrigation water, and conserve their water allotments. We will encourage all farms in phase one to implement a nutrient management plan and to conserve their water allotments. We also advise well monitoring for nitrates and deep soil sampling to a depth of two feet. Fall and winter fertilizer applications will be discouraged. To supplement these recommendations, we will require that a nitrate water analysis be conducted every four years by a certified operator of wells in the management area. All wells must have a permit and applicators of fertilizer must be certified to apply nitrogen fertilizer. Phase two of our rules and regulations will include townships with nitrate levels up to 10 parts per million and will focus on nutrient best management practices. We encourage farmers to adopt several BMPs such as filter strips, grass waterways, and riparian buffers to filter sediment and nutrients. In addition, we advise farmers to adopt a crop rotation that includes cover crops and uses conservation or no tillage tillage systems. The NRCS has found that cover crops can provide up to 100% of the nutrients required by crops, thus drastically reducing fertilizer cost and use. Another way our plan is unique is that we encourage growers to use regenerative practices such as integrating livestock into their crop rotation. Once crops have been harvested, Livestock can graze on the remaining residue, thus preparing for the next crop, adding nutrients to the soil, and minimizing the amount of land needed for pasture. According to the Rodeo Institute, this practice improves soil health and provides a nutrient source for plants that reduces chemical additions. We will also encourage farmers to use split application for fertilizers exceeding 50 pounds per acre with no more than 50% applied as pre-emergent. Fall and winter fertilizer applications will be prohibited between November 1st and March 1st. Livestock are an important part of agricultural industry, but animal feeding operations or AFOs can contribute significantly to nitrate pollution. Because of this, all AFOs must provide alternate water sources away from surface water bodies and fence off riparian areas to minimize interaction with surface water. Livestock operations that are too small to be classified as AFOs cannot be regulated by the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy. However, we recommend that wherever possible, farmers should limit livestock stream crossings to one location and fence off other riparian areas. No farmers along the East Branch for Diggory Creek will be allowed to develop AFOs as mandated in Title 130 of the Livestock Waste Control Regulations. 
all AFOs must implement a comprehensive nutrient management plan. Finally, we will require deep soil sampling every two years for nitrates, as well as protection areas around wells and monitoring for contamination. Phase three will include townships with levels greater than 10 ppm. Our goals in this phase are contamination prevention and water treatment. Farmers in these phases should consider building manure storage systems to avoid long-term nitrate leaching from AFOs. We will also require cover crops and crop rotations as mentioned in phase two. Additionally, growers must use crop reporting forms to record all nitrogen sources and use the University of Nebraska's nitrogen formula to make management decisions. This formula allows farmers to calculate alternate nutrient sources, establish a nitrogen credit for their crops, irrigation water, and soil, and reduce commercial fertilizer use. We will prohibit fertilizer applications greater than 50 pounds per acre and require nitrification inhibitors. According to the NRCS, nitrification inhibitors delay the availability of the nitrate, allowing comparatively little to leach into the environment. Because nitrate levels above 10 parts per million are a serious health risk, we require immediate wellhead protection and treatment. Water treatment, however, is expensive, so communities should research cost-effective options or apply for grants and water treatment loans. If treatment is not feasible, the community should use bottled water and search for a suitable location to drill a new well. We will also require annual water sampling to screen for dangerous levels of nitrate in wells. If nitrate levels are greater than 10 ppm for five consecutive years, the township will move into phase four. At this level of contamination, residents could experience severe health consequences. Therefore, this final phase will focus on land use change and active remediation. Farmers in these areas should consider a land use conversion based on natural resource amenities that would drastically reduce nitrate contamination. The land could be used profitably for recreation, which would encourage tourism in Nebraska and boost the local economy. For wells that extend through multiple aquifer layers, we will require the use of rehabilitation plugs. According to the Nebraska Water Wells Institute, these innovative new devices can separate different aquifer layers, thus preventing nitrate contamination from penetrating into deep flow paths. They are extremely cost-effective, costing only around $2,000 per well. Well abandonment must be conducted by a certified well driller and decommissioning forms submitted to the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources. Farmers must also submit documentation of all fertilizer purchases to the local NRD. In order to measure the success at each phase of our plan, we will monitor nitrate levels through annual well samples and reports. This data will then be made available to the public on an online database. Residents can also access water quality information through the USGS National Water Information System. Groundwater protection and natural resources are inextricably interrelated. Many of our rules and regulations have a direct impact on the soils, forests, wildlife, and aquatic e ecosystems in the BGMA. The soils of the BGMA are predominantly loamy fine sand and have a high infiltration rate. This allows for free mobility of nitrates and threatens the underlying aquifers. Our plan addresses this in several ways. Our phase one recommendation to use the University of Nebraska's crop watch will limit irrigation and reduce nitrate leaching in the sandy soil. In phase two, crop, crop rotations, cover crops, and minimal tillage will boost soil organic matter. According to the Soil Quality Institute, organic matter stabilizes the soil and increases cation exchange capacity, which enables the soil to retain nutrients such as nitrates. Our phase three requirements that farmers establish a nitrogen credit will ensure that they only apply nutrients that the plants can use immediately, thus limiting surplus mobile nitrate. Phase four land use conversions will cut contamination on the most impaired soils. Forest ecosystems in the BGMA are concentrated along the region's streams and rivers and play a crucial role in protecting both ground and surface water quality. In phase two, we suggested that farmers create riparian buffers along surface water bodies and use fencing to keep livestock out. Trees such as the eastern cottonwood 
Nebraska state tree, remediate groundwater by absorbing heavy metals and other contaminants. Furthermore, the US Forest Service has found that these trees anchor nitrates and other nutrients, stabilize stream banks, buffer floodwaters, and act as windbreaks. In addition, the BGMA supports many aquatic ecosystems and is home to a diverse wildlife community. All streams in the management area are gaining streams and are therefore very susceptible to nitrate pollution from groundwater. Our recommendations in all four phases will reduce nitrate additions into shallow groundwater and will therefore limit nitrate additions into streams. The USDA has found that conserving riparian buffers as advised in phase two can provide essential habitat for both aquatic and terrestrial populations, including some endangered and threatened species, such as the pallid sturgeon, river otter, and whooping crane. Finally, Eco Northwest has found that switching land use to a natural resource amenity driven approach, as advised in phase four, can restore native habitat for wildlife populations. Economic viability is crucial to the success of our plan. We acknowledge that implementing our set of rules and regulations will incur initial cost and long-term investment beyond current expenditures. These costs include education, nutrient management, monitoring and permitting in phase one, cover crops, livestock fencing, and alternate water sources in phase two, manure storage systems, water treatment, and testing in phase three, and land use conversions and well rehabilitation in phase four. NRVs will incur the additional costs of administering and enforcing regulations. However, the long-term profits far outweigh these costs. Consider, for instance, the direct benefits to farmers. Education programs will keep them up to date on fertilizer application technologies and ensure they are running efficient operations. According to the Sustainable Agriculture Research Foundation, cover crops drastically reduce fertilizer costs by fixing nutrients such as nitrogen for cash and forage crops. Similarly, crop rotations can increase yields 10 to 25 percent while decreasing reliance on expensive fertilizer and reducing the economic impacts of drought and other weather events. Filter strips, riparian buffers, and livestock fencing in turn will reduce expenses associated with soil losses and flood damage. Our plan will also limit the significant health costs of nitrate-related diseases, such as methemoglobinemia or blue baby syndrome. To fully appreciate these benefits, we must consider the cost of doing nothing. Over the last 20 years, water treatment in the BGMA has cost over $9 million. The municipality of Osmond alone, with a population of less than 800, 800 people, spent $1.6 million treating for nitrates. The EPA estimates that the United States uses at least $4.3 billion in water treatment, aquatic species protection, reduced recreation and tourism, and lowered property value rates. Therefore, by being proactive in our management plan, we can reduce long-term damage costs, save millions of dollars for local taxpayers, and ensure clean water for the future. There are a number of cost share programs available to farmers to help cover the cost of our plan. For example, they could apply for source water protection from the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy, as well as financial support from the Nebraska Environmental Trust for habitat, water, and soil best management practices. On a federal level, farm bill programs such as the Conservation Stewardship Program and the Environmental Quality Incentives Program offer up to a 75% cost share for practices such as riparian buffers, cover crops, and nutrient management. In phase four, farmers could, could apply to the Conservation Reserve Program to receive monetary incentives for taking farmland out of active use. As part of our management plan, there are a number of political and regulatory considerations we must address. On a federal level, our efforts will help meet the nutrient reduction goals required under the Clean Water Act. All of our measures will minimize the leaching of nitrates into local drinking water and ensure that concentrations remain below 10 ppm as required by the EPA. Our phase three requirements regarding wellhead protection remain in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Animal feeding oper or operations, as mentioned in phase two, must follow the regulations of the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy. 
Most important, local entities have authority to oversee groundwater contamination issues and water rights and allotments in the BGMA. Government groups such as local NRDs, the NRCS, and Farm Bill programs can also provide technical advice and assistance to farmers. A final pillar of groundwater protection is addressing the socio-cultural issues related to a safe water supply. As agriculturalists from the University of Arizona have found, ignoring public perspectives invites criticism and conflict, while collaboration breeds cooperation. Because public involvement is integral to the success of our plan, we incorporated community-based planning in phase one to ensure that all stakeholders can voice their concerns. These committees would foster a sense of community among residents and empower them to make informed decisions. Committees would continue to meet biannually to steer long-term management and ensure environmental justice in the BGMA. According to the EPA, an informed, involved, and supportive public is the foundation of drinking water protection. Therefore, we recommend using the BGMA and NRD websites to post public updates about all further groundwater protection initiatives. As mentioned in phase one, we also encourage farmers to attend programs to learn about nutrient management and groundwater protection. We all know that Nebraskans love their farms. Therefore, we will offer a yearly Ogallala open house on farms that showcase best nutrient management practices. Through these measures, we can maintain the strong farming traditions of the area and conserve the corn husker state for future generations of huskers. Willa Cather, a famous Nebraskan author, once said of the Great Plains, the land belongs to the future. We have an obligation now to ensure that all of Nebraska's natural resources remain healthy for future generations. By adopting our set of recommendations, you can ensure that the Brazil groundwater management area will see a reduction in nitrate levels. And you will continue to fulfill the NRD's obligation, protecting lives, protecting property, protecting the future. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm sure we do. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, congratulations on making it to the final round here. And uh, my name is Annette Sudbeck. I'm a manager with the Lewis and Clark Natural Resources District that includes the Brazil groundwater, a portion of the Brazil groundwater management area. And one of the items that of importance that you discussed was minimizing livestock interaction with surface water. Um, which of course is an important practice, but I was wondering if you could expand on its inclusion in a groundwater uh, management scenario with the phases. Yeah, so phase two, that, that's a phase two recommendation. Um, so we will recommend to, well, I just, we're requiring that farmers fence off riparian areas um, and, and that they provide a water source that is not the stream. They cannot just have their cattle in the stream to drink the water. Um, and also there are cattle um, or livestock facilities that are too small to be classified as AFOs. Um, so we can't actually regulate those, but we will suggest to them that they limit livestock crossings of streams to one location. Thank you, and um, could you just expand a little bit on how that will impact groundwater? So what we are envisioning is that by fencing off like riparian areas and limiting stream uh, crossings to one location, as well as having alternate water sources away from surface water, will cut a lot of contamination and leaching of nitrates into the groundwater through the surface water, and that will hopefully limit the nitrates that these AFOs are contributing to the groundwater. Smithfield Food Sustainability. Great job, guys. Um, I have a question. I believe it was in phase two where you mentioned using uh, water bottles as an alternative source for drinking water. Um, and that'll increase plastic waste. So I'm wondering if you have any programs or initiatives in mind to help handle that responsibly. Well, the use of water bottles would only be temporary while they would look 
for another well. Maybe some of my other teammates have an idea how we would do that. Yeah, so as Jocelyn mentioned, we haven't really thought of an option for plastic waste, but this option, water, bottled water, is only an option if you can't afford like a reverse osmosis system or ion exchanger distillation to fix your nitrate problem. And as she said, it would just be short term until they could find a new location to drill a new well or get the funds to treat their water. We would also use our public updates on the websites to encourage residents to recycle those bottles and not just throw them away. Thank you. Hi, I'm Britt Weiser with the Energy Yes. And in phase three, you had a recommendation for prohibiting nutrient applications uh, above 50 pounds per acre at any one time. Could you explain the benefits of that recommendation and if there is any risk or downside to the producer for that recommendation? Well, the benefits of that recommendation would be just reducing the amount of nitrates that are available to leach into the groundwater. And then the, the cost of that or the downside of that, of course, would be decreased pro productivity. They wouldn't have um, as much yield, possibly. So like my teammate Nicole was saying, what we're doing by limiting fertilizer applications is trying to apply the exact amount that the plants can use immediately. This will like cut excess mobile nitrate, which could leach into groundwater and raise contaminant levels. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So in phase two, we met, we recommended a lot of um, best management practice. One of those is cover crops and that, that would come in big where fertilizer is, is being limited because those cover crops, especially legumes, will add the nitrogen back into the soil and will limit the amount that you need to apply as fertilizer. And then like we mentioned, using the University of Nebraska's crop watch, you can, um, so a nitrogen credit formula, you can calculate that nitrate and then subtract it from the amount that you would have to apply through commercial additions. And I'm, a, I'm a board member, okay? So why is it difficult for board members to enact new rules and regulations? Well, one reason is that farmers might be hesitant um, considering the costs of the plan. The upfront costs of some of these measures um, might be, seem quite high to them. So that would be one reason that they would uh, feel some resistance from the farmers. To counter this resistance, we, we have like educational programs to educate the farmers on like, so the NRD is implementing laws, so it'll um, educate them on the benefits of those laws. And so, yeah, so basically educating them so they agree with you and see the benefits and not just look at the negative side of increased costs for them. Additionally, we plan to have board meetings where this will be open to farmers to voice their concerns. And so then we collaborate and come up with a solution that everyone's happy with. Thank you. Go ahead. Another reason the NRD might see resistance is because farmers are going to be hesitant to change their it's a year long, like decades of farming and like growing on their land, and they're probably going to want to stick to their tra uh, tradition. So that's why we. That's another reason for the pushback. Okay, thank you. Well, congratulations, team, for being here in the final. The director of natural resources for Nebraska and thanks for your presentation. You talked about land use changes in your phase four recommendations. I'm wondering if you considered the possibility about implementing that type of change earlier on, or rather than just using the percent of nitrogen over a certain time to look at depth to groundwater, soil combinations. In other words, maybe there's some easy pickings to be able to uh, hit and uh, remediate some areas with land use changes sooner in your process. Yeah, so we would monitor levels, um, nitrate levels, and find those areas that are the most um, impaired. 
So our land use conversion would not necessarily be like an entire farm that the farmer is changing. Um, it would be more localized areas, like specific areas on the farm um, that have the most nitrate pollution. Um, the reason we didn't consider putting it earlier in the plan is that um, a land use conversion for, for someone who's been farming the land for years and years is going to be really hard to take um, to, to change the, the tradition of farming. Um, so we, we really kind of want it as the last resort when you really cannot be applying any more nitrate on the soils because it's so impaired. Very well, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back at 410. afternoon and welcome to the 2021 NCF Envirothon Award Ceremony. My name is Tim Palmer. I'm the immediate past president of the Conservation Districts of Iowa and on the board of the, N uh, the National Conservation Foundation. We want to thank you all for joining us this week for the virtual 2021 NCF Envirothon Nebraska competition. A total of 41 teams from across the United States, Canada, and China competed to test their knowledge in the areas of aquatic ecology, forestry, soils and land use, wildlife, and the current issue, water, resource, water resources management, local control, local solutions. This year's competition is hosted by the Nebraska Association of Resource District, Resources Districts and showcased Nebraska's natural resources and resources districts across Nebraska dedicated to their conservation. When planning the Nebraska planning for the when planning began for the Nebraska competition, several years ago none of us thought that we would meet here today virtually rather than in person in Lincoln, Nebraska. Thanks to the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts, the Nebraska Host Committee, dedicated volunteers and our staff, we adapted to the circumstances and were able to provide innovative competition that challenged, inspired, and demonstrated these students' knowledge and skills that will change the world. Thank you all for your time, your dedication, creativity in making this competition happen. To help coordinate, implement, and guide the NCF Envirothon, NCF relies upon the NCF Envirothon Operating Committee. The Operating Committee is comprised of appointed representatives from the five Envirothon regions in North America. Their volunteered time and service to the Envirothon program and mission has helped grow this program into the international competition it is today. For a word, on behalf of the NCF Envirothon Operating Committee, please welcome its chair, Millie Langley. Hi everyone, I'm Millie Langley, the chair of the NCF Envirothon Operating Committee. I'm very proud of all of you team members and you advisors too. I know you've worked very hard to have made it this far to the international level of this competition. Way to go, guys. I want to thank these hardworking folks here in Nebraska who are hosting this competition this year. They've done a great job, and they've had to switch at the last minute with just months to go to a virtual competition. I believe it's been great, and I applaud all their efforts to make this an awesome competition. Okay, I'm also supposed to tell you about the operating committee. The operating committee is made up of 12 to 13 individuals from the states and provinces that participate in the Envirothon. 
they are experienced with either the NCF level or with their state or provincial level of competition. This group keeps things on an even keel. They maintain consistency from year to year, no matter where or how the competition is taking place. For example, they assisted the staff on adjusting the rules and the OP um, guidelines to fit the virtual competition. We also provide leadership during the competition um, by the CAT team. The CAT team, which is the competition advisory team, is made up of the operating committee members as well as past host, present host, and the future host. Um, our operating committee members uh, consist of myself from North Carolina, Jeannie Dryberg from Nebraska here, uh, Shawnee Nordland from Montana, Andrea McEwen from Missouri, Karen Hume from Delaware, Wendy Dodds, Ohio, Carrie Milligan, Utah, Mark Hedge from New Mexico. And that's our U.S. Uh, reps. And then we have our Canadian reps, um, Debbie Waycott from Nova Scotia, Becky Gino from New Brunswick, and Jacqueline Monteith from Manitoba. We recently said goodbye to Laurel Stake from Pennsylvania. She was a longtime Envirothon state rep and an operating committee member, and she retired a few months ago. So we wish her all good luck to her and we will greatly miss her. For all our state and provincial reps, these are your go-to people for any questions you might have. Their contact info is on the NCF Envirothon website by region. Our CAT team folks are also working very hard right here in Nebraska to make sure everything is going smoothly. They are manning the testing hotline, scoring both tests and the operating uh, and the oral presentation. Our members are Wendy Dodds, who's the chair, and myself, Karen Hume, Andrea McEwen, Carrie Milligan, and future hosts from Ohio, Katie Neininger, Natalie Gertz Young, and Kathy Vrabel Bryan. And they're Ohio for 2022. And I also want to mention our hardworking staff. They're on top of everything. Jennifer Brooks, our program manager, and Stephanie Toller, our education specialist. We appreciate everything you guys do to make the NCF Envirothon a great success. I also want to again thank the Nebraska Host Committee for all the work that's gone into this year's competition. Now, it won't be too long before you can get a good long rest. So I, Ohio is coming up in 2022. I wish them good luck in preparing for that event. Good luck to all of you teams out there, wherever you are. Thank you for participating this year virtually, and I hope to see you next year. Thanks. Thank you, Millie. Operating committee members, volunteers, and staff for your service. As mentioned, this year's NCF Envirothon com a competition is hosted by the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts. Several years ago, they made the decision to host the annual competition, a huge undertaking in a typical competition year, but they had the extra challenge of trying to host in the middle of a global pandemic. Stepping up to the challenge, the NARD, their staff, and an army of volunteers proved worthy of the task to plan and execute the most technologically innovative Envirothon yet. To say a few words, please welcome Dean Edson, Executive Director of the National or the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts. Well, th thank you, Tim. As he, as he mentioned, we originally planned this event to be all in person and my staff had gone through a lot of work to plan some details uh, for field trips. We were planning on going out to NRD recreation areas so you could see what we do on building a, a recreational flood control structures, uh, see a lot of the fishery habitats that we develop in working with our partners with the Nebraska Game of Parks. Uh, we were also gonna showcase University of Nebraska Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, 
our East Campus facility uh, with affiliated with the university that's tied to Ag and Natural Resources. Uh, we also wanted to take you to Henry Dorley Zoo up in Omaha. Um, but with this COVID issue, all of that uh, got taken away. Um, so we had to start over and charter into the unknown with the virtual competition and not really knowing how to do it for sure because it's never been done. So I would personally like to thank my staff um, who did all of the work. Um, I tried to stay out of their way uh, as much as possible because I trust them. Uh, they do a tremendous job. I'm gonna start with Jeannie Dryberg, our office manager. She's also on the NCF uh, committee, uh, has served on there for numerous years. She did a great job organizing, help organize stuff. Uh, Megan Grimes is our public relations director, did yeoman's work on helping with the technical aspect and coordinating everything. And then I have two other staff members I want to recognize, uh, Dustin Wilcox, he works on our water quantity programs. Um, he got thrust into the capacity of trying to figure out all the technology and what we could, how we could possibly do this. He did a great job. And last but not least, uh, Jennifer Swanson, who heads up our water quality programs. And she helped uh, draft up the questions for your oral exam and working with a real life experience is or issue that we're dealing with here in Nebraska. We also had 40 committee members on five different committees. Um, and these were representatives from across the state and they all wanted to meet you in person and be part of this. Uh, but they were not able to do that but they did a lot of work on helping organize. And then we had over 150 different Nebraska volunteers that committed numerous hours of time to make this event go, helped us with the fundraising even prior to pre-COVID and when we were gonna do it live and in person, uh, but it didn't work out. But all 150 of them stuck with it and um, we were, we're glad that we were able to host it and ho hopefully we pulled it off as well as we possibly could. So thank you. Well, thank you, Dean, and all the Nebraska staff and volunteers for your work, planning, and commitment. You hosted an amazing competition. <coughs> of course, the NCF Envirothon annual program, the 2021 NCF Envirothon Nebraska competition, cannot be possible without recognizing our amazing partners and sponsors. Thank you to the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Services, the Smithfield Foods Incorporated, the National Association of Conservation Districts, the US Forest Service, the National Association of State Conservation Agencies, and the National Conservation District Employees Association for your continued support and partnership with NCF and the NCF Envirothon. And again, thank you to the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts and the 23 individual resources districts across Nebraska for the sponsorship of the 2021 NCF Envirothon Nebraska competition. At this time, we would like to hear from some of our event sponsors. Please enjoy the following video message from Smithfield Foods Incorporated. Hi everyone, my name is Brooke Wynn and I am the Senior Director of Sustainability for Smithfield Foods. Smithfield is a leading food company and proud lead sponsor of the NCF Envirothon. Our partnership with the Envirothon at the local, state, and international levels has expanded and evolved in a big way over the last five years. We're excited we can connect and celebrate with you all again this year, even if virtually. Smithfield donated $90,000 this year, and through the years, our employees have volunteered hundreds of hours of their time to this Envirothon event to show our support for each of you and the National Conservation Foundation. On behalf of Smithfield's 63,000 employees across the globe, congratulations on making it to this point in the competition. You should all be extremely proud of your accomplishments. In my work for Smithfield, I oversee our company's corporate sustainability program, which focuses on things like animal welfare, environmental stewardship, and the safety and quality of the food we produce. 
Our sustainability program also focuses on supporting our people and communities across the world, including through education programs like this one. My team is responsible for strategizing how to responsibly utilize our planet's natural resources in our production of delicious, affordable food, specifically pork and protein products. This is an ongoing process and we are constantly striving to make our business even more sustainable. Working to help protect and conserve the environment is one of the most exciting things about my career today. By participating in the Envirothon program, each of you are already way ahead of where I was at your age. It is inspiring to see future leaders like you take an interest in conservation and responsible stewardship of our planet at such a young age. We're excited to see what you'll do and where this journey will take you. In fact, our future depends on you. By 2050, our global population is expected to reach 10 billion people, and that's a lot of people to feed. As our planet's resources become more and more limited, the need to produce food in a sustainable, environmentally friendly way becomes very important. Fortunately, Smithfield has been pioneering sustainability and conservation efforts for almost two decades. Through innovations we've made, a pound of pork takes less water, land, feed, and greenhouse gas emissions to produce than ever before. We are actively reducing our company's carbon footprint and have pledged to become carbon negative in all of our US company owned operations by 2030. We're also working to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 30% across our entire U.S. value chain during that same period. To achieve these goals and protect our environment, we have an entire platform of innovative projects underway across our farm, plant, and distribution center operations called Smithfield Renewables. Some examples of our renewable programs include renewable natural gas programs on our farms across the U.S. that convert hog manure into carbon negative clean energy and ongoing efforts to conserve water across our farm and facility operations and much, much more. The environmental research and education you are pursuing today will lead to many more innovations and green developments in the future, not only for our company and industry, but across the world. We can't wait to see where your discoveries take us. On behalf of Smithfield Foods, thank you for your commitment to our planet and congratulations again to each and every one of you. Thank you, Smithfield Foods, for your ongoing support of the NCF Envirothon. And next, please welcome Britt Weiser, Acting State Conservationist with the Nebraska NRCS. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to all the participants and those that made this event possible. The Natural Resources Conservation Service is a national leader within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, working with private landowners on a variety of conservation and natural resource uh, type issues. We are also a proud sponsor of many youth education and youth contests such as the Envirothon. We understand the importance of working with our youth because they are our future leaders and hopefully some future employees as well. Uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, has a variety of things we work on and we think that the future for conservation and working in the uh, sustainability arena is very bright. There are many opportunities out there. We're just getting started with many things with soil health, rangeland health. We uh, work in water conservation, improving water quality, enhancing wildlife habitat, and the list goes on and on. Uh, we think there is a lot of opportunities in this field and we hope that the uh, contestants will uh, continue their education in the environmental sciences arena and uh, consider going on and studying that in the future and uh, considering a career. It really is a very rewarding career and there is still so much to do. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. And now please welcome back uh, Dean Edson. Thank you. Um, once again, I would like to especially thank our NARD Foundation uh, for going out and raising the funds to uh, run this event. Uh, we 
our foundation sponsors not just Envirothon, but we sponsor about 20 different programs um, uh, dealing with ag and natural resources and related to youth education and youth outdoor educational experiences, even adult education. And so I really want to thank the foundation and all the supporters for the, that have contributed to the foundation over the years to help us sponsor these events. I would like to go out with one NRD video, and I believe that's next. How does a state that's 430 miles across with thousands of miles of rivers and waterways and the most irrigated land in the entire country keep its water not only clean but sustainable for generations? These colossal conquerings of our diverse landscapes are possible because of Nebraska's Natural Resources Districts. Since 1972, Nebraska's Natural Resources Districts have worked together to protect and improve Nebraska's land in all of our naturally divided districts. Each NRD is designed around our watersheds and equipped with locally elected boards directing teams of professionals, a powerful network of people who know the most about where they are and what needs to get done. With more than 80 recreation areas, 16,000 groundwater monitoring wells, and 700 flood control structures, the NRD saves our land. With Nebraska's landowners, we have even planted 100 million trees and shrubs since 1972. That's 50 trees for each Nebraskan. Our land is our future, a powerful force of rivers and rolling hills, a force waiting to be reckoned with. We face the challenges. We protect the lives and property of Nebraska. We protect the future. We are Nebraska's Natural Resources Districts. Learn more at nrdnet.org. Thank you, Dean, and thank you, Nebraska, for that amazing video. In addition to the student awards, each year the NCF Envirothon strives to recognize the dedication and commitment of outstanding volunteers and educators in the Envirothon mission with the annual Hall of Fame award. This distinction is, is awarded to individuals whose achievements have directly influenced, impacted, and promoted the Envirothon. To recognize this year's recipient, Please enjoy this message from NCF Envirothon Hall of Fame Selection Committee member, Shawnee Norland. A big Montana hello to all the Envirothon participants. I'm Shawnee Nordland and I sit on the operating committee for the NCF Envirothon and I am also a past chairman of the NCF Envirothon and I'm here to present the Hall of Fame award. The Hall of Fame was started in 2005. It recognizes the achievements of state and provincial representatives and how these individuals have directly influenced and promote the NCF Envirothon. One has to be nominated for this award and then the past chairman's vote on who is the most deserving person. This year's recipient is Sue Cummings. She is retired U.S. Forest Service out of Washington, D.C. She has returned to her home state of Montana. She has been involved with the Envirothon for 18. 18 years and has helped in securing funds for the diversity grant from the U.S. Forest Service. She is the most deserving person to receive this award. She has volunteered and judged at many past NCF Envirothons and helped secure the funds with the U.S. Forest Service for that diversity grants. Thank you, Sue, for all you have done and here is your award and Thank so you. happy that you received it. I could say a couple things. Yes. I just wanted to say when I started um, in our conservation education staff at the Forest Service, um, the Envirothon, NCF Envirothon now, um, was a very important way for us to reach high school students. We had a lot of things for elementary and middle school, but this was great for the whole forestry, soils, aquatics, and wildlife, and of course every year that different um, theme. Um, so. I was proud and happy to get funds um, through my staff and even above um, for the oh. NCF environment. No, I, no. Congratulations to Sue Cummings on this well-deserved honor. The Envirothon program encourages students to expand their knowledge and explore, and explore environmental ecology, natural resource conservation in the areas of aquatic ecology, 
forestry, soils and land use, wildlife, and a current environmental issue. Teams competing this week are tested and scored on their knowledge and performance on five different resource tests and an oral, comp oral presentation component. At this time, I would like to recognize the top scoring team in each of the six scored components. The first award tonight is the Don and Mary Jane Spickler Oral Presentation Award to the team with the highest oral presentation score after pre preliminary round of judging yesterday. Teams were asked to develop and deliver a 20-minute oral presentation to a panel of judges. This year's scenario reflected the current issue of water resources management, local control, local solutions. The winning team will receive a plaque commemorating their achievement. In addition, the sp their sponsoring state, provincial, or partner nation Envirothon program will receive $1,000 from the National Conservation Foundation. This year's Don and Mary Jane Spickler Oral Presentation Award winner with a preliminary oral presentation score of 178 points is Manitoba. Congratulations, Manitoba. In aquatic ecology, students study marine and freshwater ecology, learn to identify aquatic organisms, manage watersheds, mitigate the effects of non-point source pollution, and more. The aquatic ecology test demonstrates a team's understanding of this vital natural resource. The team with the highest score on the aquatics ecology exam with a score of 82 points is New Mexico. Congratulations. With this year's current issue, water resources management, local control, local solutions, students learned the concepts of how water is managed and how the local natural resources district system works to address integrated water management challenges. The team with the highest score on the current issue exam with a score of 82 points is New York. Congratulations, New York. <laughs> On the forestry test, students demonstrate their understanding of forest ecosystems, species identification, forest structure and dynamics, management techniques, and more. The team with the highest score on the forestry exam with a score of 91 points is Ontario. Congratulations, Ontario. With the soils and land use tests, teams are tested on soil ecology, characteristic structure, land use management techniques, and conservation practices for urban, rural, and agricultural use. The team with the highest score on the land use exam with a score of 89 points is South Carolina. Congratulations, South Carolina. And the last is the wildlife test covered wildlife ecology, classification, adaptations, species identification, human interactions and impacts, and habitat conservation. The team with the highest score on the wildlife exam with a score of 95 points is New York. Congratulations, New York. The combined scores of the six components are tabulated for an overall team, and rank, team ranking and awards. And this year, we will be recognizing the top 10 overall teams thanks to award sponsorships from the Conservation Districts of Iowa, the Nebraska Association of Resources District Foundation, the National Conservation Foundation, and Smithfield Foods. In 10th place, with a combined score of 490 points, is Manitoba. Congratulations, the team will receive a $250 award courtesy of the Conservation Districts of Iowa. In ninth place, with a combined score of 495 points, is Maryland. 
Maryland, the team will receive a $750 award courtesy of the Conservation Districts of Iowa. And in eighth place with a combined score of 497 points is Ontario. That team will receive a $750 award courtesy of the Conservation Districts of Iowa. Congratulations, teams. Now, to announce the seventh through fourth place awards sponsored by the Nebraska Association of Resource Conservation Districts Foundation, I would like to recognize Jim Eshelman, president of NARD. Thank you. Uh, these awards are, are uh, with contribution from 23 Nebraska NRDs. I, seventh place, I don't have point totals, but Pennsylvania got seventh place and wins $2,500. In sixth place, New Mexico wins $3,000. In fifth place, Florida, $3,500. And in fourth place, Massachusetts gets $4,000. Congratulations. Thank you and congratulations to those teams and thank you for the, to the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts Foundation for their support. For several years now, Smithfield Foods has been the main corporate sponsor of the NCF and Firethon uh, contest. The National Conservation Foundation and the NCF and Firethon are extremely grateful for their support and belief in our mission. Smithfield actively supports NCF Envirothon and its efforts to advance environmental education, aligning with Ms. Smithfield's environmental initiatives and commitment to the vitality of its local communities. Across the U.S., Smithfield actively encourages its employees to volunteer at local Envirothon competitions as well as the NCF Envirothon International events. Here in Nebraska, Smithfield supports the Nebraska Advarathon program annually through donations and volunteers. And this year, Smithfield Foods is again sponsoring the scholarship awards for the top three teams. I'd like to introduce Alyssa Hamill with Smithfield Foods to introduce the top three teams. Thank you. First of all, I want to congratulate all the teams for making it to the international competition. You should be very proud of all of your hard work and efforts that brought you here. Without further ado, in third place, receiving a $5,000 scholarship for the team with a combined score of 491 points is South Carolina. Congratulations, South Carolina. In second place, receiving a $10,000 scholarship award for the team with a combined score of 550 points is North Carolina. Congratulations, North Carolina. And finally, in first place, receiving a $15,000 scholarship award for the team with a combined score of 571 points is New York. <laughs> Congratulations, New York and all of the teams. Congratulations to, to, to all the teams tonight on your achievement. To your commitment to the Envirothon, or to the environment, our natural resources, and the future of conservation. Thank you. At this time, Please welcome Gene Dryberg, 2021 host chair, and Wendy Dodds, 2022 host chair, for a very special presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Jeannie Dryberg, and I am co-chair of the Nebraska Host Committee. And I want to thank everybody for your participation in our Envirothon Nebraska event this week. And I want to take the opportunity to introduce the rest of our host um, committee, Dustin Wilcox. Dustin was, did a lot of the planning uh, with the opening and the closing ceremonies. Megan Grimes, and Megan was your behind the scene HUVA expert, as well as um, really coordinated, helped with the volunteers. And Jennifer Swanson, and Jennifer worked with the test writers, um, creating those tests in the OP scenario as well. We wanna thank um, our committees, 
We want to thank all the volunteers across the state of Nebraska, Jennifer and Stephanie with NCF. Everyone did an um, outstanding job this week to create a great event. And now we would love to, and we're excited to pass the reins on to Wendy Dodds and her Ohio host committee. And uh, we want to thank each and every one of you for your help this week. You guys helped make this um, a good week and we appreciate it. So with our gratitude, we would like to um, crown you with our Husker <laughs> corn cob corn head. <laughs> It'll, it can be like your thinking cap, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we wish you the best. We wish you the best with your a year of productive planning, hoping for no hiccups, great weather for your event, and um, so many volunteers, you won't know what to do with them. <laughs> but if you ever find yourself in a trying time, we want you to dig into this basket and find some comfort <laughs> from Nebraska. Uh, we wish you the best, and we're looking forward to Envirothon Ohio 2022. All right. Thank you, Jeannie, and your host committee. You guys were amazing hosts. Um, it was great to be here. I think that um, our Ohio host committee has learned a lot about moving forward with the next competition, which will be in person in Ohio. Uh, the dates are going to be July 24th through July 29th, 2022, and we'll be hosting the event at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Uh, so we're excited to get people to Ohio. Just want to quickly introduce some of our committee members. Behind me, I have Katie Naniger, Natalie Gertz Young, <laughs> and Kathy Vrabel Bryan. So that's just a a couple of our committee members that are hoping to host the event. So we are really looking forward to having it at Ohio. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think that it's a big undertaking and um, I wish that it didn't have to be virtual this mm -hmm. year, but you guys did an amazing, amazing job and we appreciate everything. So. Thank you. <laughs> looking forward to Ohio in 2022. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy, and the Ohio, the Ohio Host Committee. We look forward to enjoying and uh, joining you in Ohio next year. And thank you, Gene, and the entire Nebraska Host Committee, and all the volunteers who made the 2021 event possible. I want to again thank the and the national or the Nebraska Association of Resources Districts, the uh, National Resources Districts uh, Foundation in Nebraska, Smithfield Foods, Inc., and all or Smithfield Foods Inc., and all the other sponsors and and partners who made tonight possible and this competition possible. There are so many things that, that can come from an opportunity like this to, uh, to compete, the friendships that, that hopefully in the future you'll have the opportunity to make face to face. Uh, this uh, dealing with what we have this uh, last couple of years has, has been hard uh, to, for everyone to deal with but the friendships you make uh, when you're in the competition are lifelong. So with that, I would like to thank you all for competing. Thank you all for the time. Thank you all for all of those who uh, uh, had the hand in making sure that this was pulled off. I wish you a good night and look forward to seeing you all in 2022.